Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Sunday. Welcome to the AV Experience Podcast. Man, I don't know why, but I'm in a super incredible mood, man. What about you guys? <laughs> I'm in a better mood than last week. I you're don't in a much like... better mood. <laughs> you had a rough week last week. I was, it was something. You were struggling, man. It was a, it was a week. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on yeah. and it just kept piling on. How was your week, Jonathan? You got a week off, two weeks off from us. Yeah. yeah it, uh, time was nice. Lately, my whole family's sick. So it's just me and one girl out of my four girls that's not sick. My wife's sick and everybody. So hopefully that will end soon. But sure. otherwise, good day. That's awesome, man. Yeah, we had people in the chat that like, y'all kick Jonathan off. He's not coming back. I'm like, dude, man, he's got family <laughs> obligations, man. He's There's yeah. no absolute got to be here it's like we love having him here but man when stuff is family always comes first and that's for both of you guys and even with me i mean there are gonna be times that i need to take away from my family or take away to be with my family and i will absolutely do that right um, but most unless part, you're this guy i'm always here when youth man's live you stop whatever you're doing <laughs> to tune in appreciate you perfect dark i love it man yeah you now, guys are excited too man I is see these perfect guys dark is that from the n64 game or is he not old enough and that's from the Xbox 360 game? Yeah, let us know. The N64 know. Game. Or Benny, what's up, buddy? Benny was our photographer last year for M-Wave. Super excited to see you, buddy. Man, we got folks from Canada. 85 Toronto. in Arizona. It is uh, not 85 here. Nope. It's 85 here. We were at the pumpkin patch, like, or not pumpkin patch, but the fall festival at our church. Took my grandson Roman today. He's in this enough there to grow, grow pumpkins. That no, they probably problem. import them things, no. man. <laughs> he, he uh he had this onesie hoodie. He was uh poo poo bear, mm -hmm. cute man, so stinking cute. But dude, I know he's like just drenched in sweat. So we bought him one of those um what do you call them the not icy um shaved ice. But just mm. no flavoring on it, just ice and just fed him the ice, man. He was just how old down. is he? He's one, almost one. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's super young, dude. But yeah, pumpkins imported from China. I don't know where they get them from, but it ain't in Florida, man. We get strawberries and mo I mean, we're the strawberry capital of the world here in Plant City. That was a joke. I'm sure it I don't know what the yeah, I don't know where I don't know where pumpkins, they get but it's from. I don't think they'll care if it's too warm. It's like four Celsius here. I mean, it's only one Celsius here. <laughs> and one here. Now, oh, you got them too. You're hooked, man. So what's I, your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite flavor? Orange. The orange, really. Orange. And then uh the other one is I think it's grape sour apple because it tastes exactly like a apple jolly rancher. Okay. Interesting. It's so good. But the orange one's my favorite. Jonathan, have you tried them yet? I haven't tried them yet. Well, are they a caffeine drink or what are they? They're caffeine. Yeah, it's caffeine. No, no sugar. Um, 10, 10 There's calories. No aspartame. It's, yeah. it's an energy drink that actually tastes really good. It doesn't give me energy though. I mean, maybe because I'm always like just so high strong ADD. <laughs> this is why you wired. don't go to bed till three in the morning. And he's like, I don't give me energy. <laughs> Not going to sleep till three in the morning. Yeah. It's, it's giving you something. Yeah. See, look, Ryan must have had a nap. He's smiling. Too. No, He's I'm I'm just not overburdened with crap. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Joe, you don't know, bro? Heck yeah. We're the strawberry capital of the world. Like, literally, that's what we're known for. Tons and tons. We have a lot of migrant families that come, even from Mexico and even Guatemala, and they come here literally just to help farm. I mean, so we do a lot, a lot, a lot of strawberries. We even have a... Uh, it's a local event that people come from all over the U S which is weird to me because it's not really that big, but it's the strawberry festival. And so we have just a big old kind of like your state fair, but maybe a little bit smaller. They've got rides and all kinds of food and little knickknack shops that you can buy handcrafted kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah. Oh, sweet, man. Howard. Good to see you, man. From Singapore. Yeah. I love hearing where you guys are from, man. Folks from Raleigh. I like Raleigh, man. Sweet. Well, guys, we are going to, I'm going to give you an update on M Wave. We got a fun topic tonight. I think this is going to be fun. And then we'll jump into your questions. So if you got home theater, what's that? 
I still don't know what the topic is. I'll throw it out there so you can be thinking of it. So we're gonna address this tonight. So what's one thing you wish you had learned earlier in your home theater oh, journey? That question so, was part of the topic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So oh. we're gonna we'll talk about that. We'll have some fun with that. And uh, but if you've got questions, drop those in the chat. We'll get to those in order, unless it's super chat, and then they get bumped up to the top and we'll address those first, but certainly not required. So let me give you just a couple quick updates on M-Wave. We are literally a couple of days away from general admission going live. So November 1st on the website, MidwestAVExperience.com, the general admission uh, registration will be ready. It'll be live. Same price as last year, 75. Um, I want to share with you just a couple slides. So this was a post. Well, a couple of these pictures are posts that I've been doing daily. Uh, one of them I talked about the Perlison room, which is that top right one. That was an amazing setup. A lot of different vendors came together for that room. Seymour, uh, Perlison, Storm Audio, Barco, Row One Seating, Mad VR. So that was just like powerhouse room. All these, you know, the high end speaker manufacturers and um projector manufacturer what projector oh the barker that's right mm -hmm. um so just beautiful setup there but down below that man svs kicked it man it was a great very budget friendly system that system sounded amazing to the far left we had a room set up with a bunch of different comparisons we like to have comparisons at mwave um some of them are kind of fun it's not meant to be a a technical experiment it's hard to do that number one with you know, 300 people. Um, and plus the fact of trying to move that big, massive GSG subwoofer around and, and do that. So we had a speaker comparison. We did a subwoofer comparison. We asked everybody to kind of move seats and that showed you, okay, if I sit here, I may get one experience, but then if I move over, I get a different experience just showing you about room modes and stuff. But that was just a fun thing. We did not get a chance to do the tactile transducers. Um, so behind the theater seats, those are Valencia. You can see on the bottom right, there's like a platform, boss platform or hover easy. I'm not sure which one. Um, there was a near field subwoofer directly behind that second seat. And then in the first seat on the far left was Valencia's new um, uh, tactile, like almost like base shakers. I don't think they were the D-Box ones. They were just base no, shakers. No, no. So, but we didn't get a chance to do that. So we're going to bring that back this year. We had... Well, we did it for like two people. Okay. Yeah, we had a technical issue. We had to give up a, one of the processors for another room to help them out. Mm -hmm. And so that shut down that that uh, comparison. But we're going to do a bunch of that stuff again this year. We did speaker wire comparisons. This year, it's going to be a lot more organized as far as on a schedule. So we'll do them for set times. That way you'll know on the schedule, okay, if I want to go to the subwoofer comparison, Here's the times that they'll be available. Yep. Um, and we will probably have to have some kind of sign up or we got to work out some of the logistics on that because we're expecting even a lot more people this year. Uh, last year, first year we had 83 last year, which is technically this year. Um, we had right over 300 and we expect we could definitely get closer, maybe even exceed a thousand. So we're really excited about this based on feedback I've been getting. All this week, as I've been promoting this on social, I've been getting things. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll mention this. RBH is a new brand uh, that's going to be there this year. We're excited to have them set up a full Dolby Atmos experience there. They don't know exactly what models they're bringing, um, but they've got some more affordable stuff. And then, of course, they got the really high end stuff like those big, massive towers there. I think that's the ones that Gene Della Sala has with Audioholics. I believe that's a 24 inch subwoofer there. It's one of their new ones. I think so, it's a 21. Is it 21? I can't remember if it's 21. I or think 21. it's a 21. If that's the one that like Kellen and stuff talks about yeah, a lot, I probably. think that's it. Yeah. So yeah, so we're going to, um, so we're excited to have them. We're reaching out to brands now, getting those lined up. And, and so as they commit, then we'll be adding those to the website. So you can see that. 
But here's something I thought was cool, man. I've been getting messages and emails, and this is one of my patrons, Scott McKendrick. He says he sent me a message tonight, like right before the show. He's like, "Hey, dude, I just bought my flight, and Airbnb for M Wave. I'll be in on the 19th. I'll leave on the 24th. Can't wait." Had another guy, Chris Conti, just earlier today. You can see this is at 7:35, so about 45 minutes ago. He said, man, my hotel's booked, got my plane ride. Now I'm just waiting until November 1st and I'll be all set. So we got folks that are super pumped about this. The gentleman from the UK has already booked his stay and got his flight and everything. So, um, man, I am really, really excited for you guys. We've got some cool things in store. We've got new home theater, VIP home theater experiences. I shared with you that on, I think, last week's podcast. You had a separate video for it too, I think. That's what it was. Okay. So yeah, check the channel for that. I had an update on that. Gave you all the details. Um, so we're excited, man. Just going to be a really, really fun time. We've got some new home theaters that have been added to the mix. Stephen Dew, uh, Ivan. Um, Chirpy. Is there one more? Chirpy. Chirpy, he's building a home theater. That thing's going to be huge. But you can check that out on the website. Go to MidwestAviExperience.com. Up at the top, just click on or hover over attend, and you'll see the second option. How says, big is Chirpy's room? It's big, dude. Yeah, 12 Let foot me, tall it's, ceilings, it's, pretty deep. I don't know the dimensions. Right, Michael will have that. Let's let's find out, shall we? We will check this out together. Midwest AV experience right up here. Attend home theater experiences. We got Ryan, we got Jonathan's, Ivan's. Sheldon's chirpy and then Steven do. So his room right here, his outer shell, let's say the inner dimension is 26 by 18 by 11.25. So he's got hmm. 10. Are y'all seeing the big screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's showing up. Cool. Look at there, man. <laughs> he's got some massive subwoofers. So yeah, he's in the process of building out his theater room. This so check this out. Pause here for a second, Michael. Okay. Yep. Do you Get see how room. that floor is dug out there? Scroll back one picture. Mm, right here. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other floor is dug out. Yeah. He had a house custom built, and he wanted his theater to be, I think it's 14 foot tall, Ryan. Is that right? Is that what you remember? Yeah. 14 foot tall. He had the plans done. They agreed on it. And when it all got done, it was 12 foot deep. And he was mad. Mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't work it out. They wouldn't help him out. So that it would change too much stuff and they couldn't do it. So he just decided to like jackhammer out the floor himself and make it his 14 foot no. deep so that he could have the depth he wanted. Wow. Yeah. That's commitment there guys. And Holy did it God. himself. Carried all the dirt out by bucket, poured the concrete. Oh, the guys, okay. he's a, he's the real deal. Like he's how is he not, really how deal. did he get around the sump? I don't know where his sump is in there. That'd be a question for him to answer. Wow, I, I would assume he has to have one in that bottom tier, but maybe that would not. be my guess. You'd have to. Yeah, so he's got the same speakers that you have, Jonathan. Correct? Yes, for his bed layer. I'm not sure what he's doing for the height yet. He may not even know yet. Yeah. So, but look at this room, man. That's a big room, man. That's going to be amazing. So these VIP home theater experiences are going to be available. They'll be just an a la carte um, add-on to your general admission ticket. So you can, those will go live. General mission will go live on November the 1st. VIP home theater experiences will go live a month later. Cause that just, I need more time to get all of the information on the website, get the shopping cart built and everything. Um, and what we're doing this year that's different is we're only going to allow the amount of people that they have seats for. So like in his case, he's got 10 seats. And there'll be three different time slots. It'll be like a, a morning, a mid-afternoon, and an evening or early evening. And so there'll be 10 in the morning, 10 in the middle of the day, 10 in the evening. That's it. Um, Jonathan, you have how many seats in yours? Six. So Jonathan has six. So he's only going to have 18 people that can visit his home theater. And then Ryan has one. <laughs> three. <laughs> so Ryan has three. So only nine people are going to get to visit Ryan's and home. And I think... I think my the theater, mm. the changes will be done by then, I hope. Mm. So he's working on some new stuff. So that'll be super cool. So as you figure that out, let me know and I can get the website updated. But okay. just trying to give you guys as much heads up as possible. 
and um, you can go ahead and be viewing all of the um, VIP home theater experiences on the website right now. Just Get so out of here. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's right. He, likes, he really likes the all natural look. Okay. That's really what he likes. He'll be wanting a refund, man. You know, that riser. That's awesome. But yeah, man, we are seriously, we're super pumped. We're super grateful. We're really just trying to do something that hasn't been done in the AV event space. I mean, there are a handful of people that are doing really small events, like for almost like a private group, just a really small select 10, 20 people. We want to open this up to as many people to be able to experience the home theater tours or the home theater experiences the side-by-side -side AB comparisons with projectors and speakers and, um, you know, whatever else we decide to, you know, to compare. Um, and it's been challenging. It's been fun. It's been, we're learning a lot. And um, like I said, we're just trying to create something that's just really, really cool and really unique. And people are really seem to be responding very, very well, not only attendees, but also vendors. They seem to be very pleased as well. So Cool. Couple super chats here. So living it with Scott and cat podcast. Thank you so much. $5 super chat. Hey gentlemen, I got more than just a shameless plug this week. I have a JVC 590 R with a new bulb and it's calibrated 4k to 6k. What is my upgrade? So Scott, I did his uh, home theater tour not too long ago when he had his event. And he said, Michael, he said, you know, speaker wise, subwoofer wise, honestly, I think I'm done. I'm finally done with 38, 18 inches. I think. No, he's not. He <laughs> You're never done. <laughs> he's got a lot, but he says, you know, I'd, I'd really like to up my game on my projector sometime down the road. And so, um, he's got four grand, six grand. What's he looking at there, fellas? What would be a good upgrade to the 590? How big's his screen? He's got Scott has a small room, right? For yeah, it's not computer. huge. Yeah. <clears throat> what's the what's the cor screen. correlation on that model number? What's the RS equivalent on that? Do you guys remember that 590R? That I don't know. I don't know. He says 132 inch. Scott, do you know what the equivalent to or anybody in the chat what the equivalent to the 590R is on the RS series? It's 2018. It's a 1080p source E Shift Five, so it's their last iteration. That okay. might be the that might be the mm -hmm. 440. Might be RS 440. Okay. Yes, there you go. Mark says 440. So <clears throat> that one. Did the 440 still have problems with sync times? 440 was okay with sync times it takes about 10 seconds or so for that one to sync but it does it still doesn't have the tone mapping no cool. basically terrible hdr mm. but if you tone map it with sdr we saw that it does really well because we saw 420 in mm -hmm. that january projector shootout and did really well yeah but didn't uh, that have that had it mad vr though on it didn't it yes yes yeah. tone mapping to sdr that's correct yeah so mad yeah that's fine and so Ryan, he's looking at a, he's got a 132. The it's benefit gonna be you're going to see, Scott, is going to be basically not so much in black levels. Your black levels will actually go down if you get a new mm -hmm. laser or a, a, even a newer bulb from the NX series because that 1080p contrast setting was better than the 4K JVCs. Slightly. However, you'll get better brightness out of the newer models and you'll absolutely get better tone mapping because that mm -hmm. 540 has terrible tone mapping. So if you're trying yeah. to watch it native without any kind of remap to SDR, You'll have an upgrade. For and technically, channel. you'll get better resolution because it was an e shifter, but not mm -hmm. that you would notice that. But it, that's, you do. yeah, that's kind of minor in the scheme yeah. of things. Um, I'll, I'll say this: you're darn lucky that thing hasn't failed you because, <laughs> I mean, really, that that level of base uh, in a 140 <laughs> dB base. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not playing. 140. So I'm dB laughing base. because I know you're serious. I not up my LCD panels on my Epson years ago. <laughs> so that's one of the things that he told me when I was talking about mm -hmm. his tour. He said. I'm hesitant to buy a nice projector because of that. There's there's 150 dB in his room. That's a lot of pressure, and it definitely can rattle some stuff around. I guarantee so JBC is in engineering for 150 dB. I guarantee No! It. <laughs> well, okay, hold on. Actually, a lot it of the JVCs, well, JVCs are, their primary gig is 
flight commercial sim. flight sim. commercial yes. flight, flight sim. Sim. so yeah. that's not 150 db no but they still. hardly have sound in some of those things <laughs> we're in a headset i i think if he's used to a jvc he's gonna have a really hard time going yeah. to anything else okay oh here so he asked do i want an epson or a jvc in that four thousand to six thousand I'd say a JVC. Figure out I'm why hard. you're upgrading, Scott. What are you wanting? No. Yeah. Because you're, I mean, if you got enough brightness now, you already got, if you're using SDR, you already got like the same or even, I'm going to say practical purposes, the same picture. Mm -hmm. If you want more brightness, you can get a newer one. That'll do that. But you're not going to gain any ground on SDR. And if you're remapping HDR to SDR, then you're not going to get any ground except for brightness, really. You got, you got, a model that a lot of people say is kind of JVC's flagship. He, he wants better HDR. Mm -hmm. In that realm, so anyway. Bill says, so definitely that might be one thing to check. Definitely is look at the short or the the throw distance capability of both of them. Well, the make... LS twelve thousand is going to have a better throw, and that's what Bill says. So you have JVC's the has the worst out of Epson, Sony, and JVC. Scott, you saw the Epson LS12000 at my house, and you saw NZ7s at other people's houses, I'm sure, NZ8s, NZ9s. So you kind of have a, that in your in your mind. You kind of just have to pull it. I want to know what way off. Scott is leaning. Maybe he's just looking for a confirmation bias. Yeah. Maybe he's already bought it. Probably. Probably with all that ad revenue that he's been making on his channel. He's got a new YouTube channel, man. He's balling. <laughs> uh, he's working towards 1,000 subscribers, so help him out. You guys want to send some love his way? I know he'd appreciate it. I think it's if he's used to a JVC, he's going to be hard pressed to get anything that's not a JVC. Yeah. Some are saying the refurb NZ7s are around eight, or maybe go with the NP5. Scott, just text me. He we'll says I love the JVC. All right. He's got my contact info. Just text yeah. me. Yeah. He said he loves the JVC, but the Epson looks sweet. Honestly, they're both great projectors. There's no doubt. They both make great projectors. We've seen them at M-Wave. I've seen them at Jonathan's house. Jonathan just did a video. All right, Jonathan, we got to work on your videos, man. Your video is like 35 seconds long. <laughs> it's a it's to prove a point in a forum argument. That's all. I was like, come on, man. Give us some meat. Tell me what you think. I want to hear your opinion. I want to see. I know people are, are looking for that. So. <laughs> He was like, let me know what you think. And then the video ends. You're like, that was 35 seconds. I don't know. It was, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I was just literally the, the document and argument in a forum. That's all. <laughs> it, really thing. what it meant is troll people. That's right. No trolling. Not that it was trolling, but you did rile some feathers up with that video. Yeah. I rile up feathers all the time on ABS forum. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. You did um, some motion interpolation on that one, right? Yeah, the frame interpolation is just flat out way better on the Epson. So yeah. if you like fast JVC's motion stuff, bad. then no. you know that's your that's your ballpark for the Epson's sure. projectors functions. Yeah. Cool, man. All right, so I gave you the update on that. All right, let's jump into this topic. You want to? Well, no, no, no. You got another super chat. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let me go back here. Thanks for reminding me. All right, You're welcome. That one. You'd be lost Boom. without me. They appreciate it, Joe, the French Canadian. Uh, let's see. How room gain is a part of choosing subwoofers? Following the 12 dB rule, I can expect 23 hertz and below for my room. Do I add 12 dB to the CEA 2010 specs? All right. There's a lot to unpack there. Joe, can you tell us what you're thinking? The 12 dB rule, rule is getting you to 23 hertz. I, I want to know more about that. I'm hoping you don't have like a 35 hertz tuned sub and you're thinking you can get 12 dB a tune before you port tune and that kind of thing. Rel oh, T8. It's a what? I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's know what kind of uh, subwoofer you have in your room. I'm looking at the chat now. Here, I want to talk to something while he's answering that question. Okay. I'll look, I'll Those look generic that. specs where they're talking about generic room gain is going to be very room specific. I've measured a lot of rooms and it's not, there is not a standard thing. No matter what you read on the forums, it just isn't. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Stephen Dew, one of the guys that's on the home theater tour, the experience tour, mm -hmm. he had his eight mm -hmm. 18s corner loaded in a small room, four high with against the concrete wall. He had to cut at 20 hertz because he was getting so much boosting. He had to cut significantly. It wasn't just a little bit to keep a flat line. 
Yeah. I have eight eighteens in this room. Mine are not corner loaded. There's a storage space behind the front wall. I have to boost by nine dB plus at twenty hertz with the with the same basic subwoofers eight eighteens to get my to flat at twenty hertz. So okay. your room gain is not universal. It's going to depend on placement. It's going to depend on room size. It's going to depend on if you're using a concrete loading, like in a corner load. All that stuff plays into it. You can't trust you're just going to get 12 dB room so gain. So here's what I think. He says he's got two PB16s, or he's looking at two PB16s. I still think, based on your budget, you get the most capable sub you possibly can, regardless of what you think your room gain is going to be. I don't think it really... I mean, it matters, but... I still think you want the most capable equipment you can possibly get. You're mm -hmm. just going to have a better experience. It's going to be able to dig deeper a lot of times. It's going to have typically a better frequency response, lower distortion, more output. Don't buy based on what you think fits. In my opinion, you always want to exceed. Because going back to what Scott said, I'm done. You're never done. Ever. <laughs> you're you're going to get something. That. You're going to get something. Mm -hmm. And then... You, it, a year, two years, sometime down the line, you're going to be like, I want more. It's what happens. It's the, everybody, when you're an enthusiast, when you're viewing this channel, when you're getting with other people, you come to M wave, it just snowballs. You see other people's stuff and you're like, well, I could, why don't I do that? And if you don't have the equipment already that can do it, you end up upgrading. Yeah. So I think and somebody asked this question, what we think about buy once, cry once. And I think we can just roll into this real quick. Mm -hmm. Buy once, cry once, like get the best that you can possibly mm -hmm. get. Don't beat around the bush. Don't try and cut corners. You're going to regret it. I've done it numerous times. Sure I think are. everybody in this here, Jonathan, yeah. Michael has done this. Yeah. It, you always buy things and like, oh, I'm going to save money. And then you're always back. Why did I do that? Sometimes it's buy once and cry over a weekend. I mean, like, you're like, God, or cry over a month, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Get divorced, whatever <laughs> happens. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Have a, don't, don't do that. that. The other thing is, you really shouldn't be expecting room gain below port tune. So those SVS no. aren't port tuned at 23 hertz. They're port tuned probably. They'll go down. I don't know, I'm going to guess 18 or 18. Yeah. Or something. I think I, I measured them down to probably about 16 hertz in my room, if I remember correctly. I think I, I had just, a CD key. Back to these. Yeah, I had two on their side. It says fifteen plus or minus three dB. Yeah, but James mm -hmm. did a review on the PB sixteens, and he's actually got measurements for them. Yeah, I'd have. To, man, that was old videos. So, so when people talk it. about room gain with ported subs, you don't, you shouldn't be counting that more than just like maybe two or three hertz below your port tune at most. Yeah, below that, the driver's unloading. It's not under control. There's tons of distortion. It's not room gain that you want at that point. Mm -hmm. You're not even going to be playing the sub loud. It's going to be filtered off at that point so you you don't think of it as like a sealed driver below port tune it's not here i'm yeah. gonna post this in private chat and then michael can post this if he wants this is the this is james larson's measurements on i know but it, i think it works better coming from you in chat okay. I, don't, I don't know well it's gonna come from all well here I'll that's fine I'll, they come from but these are the measurements for the pb16 in a field so take it for what it is um what says james larson measurements on what the PB-16. PB-16. Oh, not 15. I'll drop it in the chat, guys. Here you go. And that's without any type of room gain. So that would yeah, be starting nothing. from nothing. Ground plane. So nothing around. Yeah, Brian, you shouldn't even talk based on your buying history. <laughs> Let's, you can't. You have no space in oh, this. This is awesome. This Buy four times, sell four times. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. Nothing but regret right here, dude. Uh, look at this. My retirement is diminishing every day because of my love for home theater. But Jonathan and Michael, if you were going to buy something in the price point of the PB-16, would you? Would it be the PB-16? What would you get? Hmm. I don't know. Sub? I, I want to measure the... Aren't, well, it's going to be a little different because I've got the sealed versions. I could go back and look and see what I measured the Arndall 2Vs. That would be similar because that's got... 13.8 inch the pb 16 is twenty nine hundred dollars yeah it's getting on up there used to be 25 yeah. would you just spend cry a little bit and spend a little bit more and get the jtr i mean for if you're looking at close to three grand and the rs1 is now what msr 33 oh 300 bucks well 400 
Okay, four hundred bucks, hundred percent, hundred percent. Is there anything else that you would consider in that price range? I haven't reviewed the shoe. I've got a fit. That's a fifteen inch. I don't know if. But I don't think the. I I like the shoe, but I don't think it's on the same playing field as the JTR. I mean, four hundred bucks. That I mean, when you're talking fifteen hundred bucks, that's a big, big, big jump. I think the difference that you're going to get for four hundred bucks going from a PB sixteen to an RS one. That's huge, man. I mean, like I said, I'm getting mine are down to five hertz in my room. That's just crazy. I mean, Jonathan, what would you do? I I like SVS products. I do think they're overpriced at this point. They mm-hmm. didn't used to be. The top of the line flagship stuff used to be twelve hundred bucks or something, sure. and then it just kind of drifted up over the years as their name got better well known. They yeah. make a nice product. I mean, realistically, they have phone control for the amp or for the mm-hmm. subwoofer. You can get wireless mm-hmm. connections. Like it's got mm-hmm. a nice yeah. DSP. They're well built. They look good. They're a little overpriced. But um, you could also even build some too and get a killer eighteen inch. Yeah. So there are do-it-yourself companies that like they laser cut the wood out, CNC cut it out, and you yes, can yeah. just assemble it yeah. without having hardly any tools at all, you, just some wood glue. You don't even need clamps for some of their builds. And then you buy a $300 driver, you stick it in there, you buy a $600 amp or so, you're looking at maybe a thousand bucks or so for an 18 inch sealed driver that's really pretty impressive. So yeah. if you have any, any inkling to do do-it-yourself stuff, it's kind of the way to go with subwoofers. Now, you guys mentioned what other companies would you recommend? I think HSU is kind of one of the last companies that's still standing making uh, inexpensive, nice mm-hmm. products. Yeah. So they're, they're still they're, internet direct. I think that's the biggest reason. So SVS used to be internet direct. Yeah. And then when they started the Best Buy selling and, Best mm-hmm. Buy, okay, Best now they've got a lot more overhead. Best Buy's got to make their cut. Um, mm-hmm. And so it, it's just gone up from there. So if I may recommend the HSU VTF 15 H, you can get a dual drive system of that. And that is, and I've said it before in this podcast, that's the sub that really made me realize there was a whole nother level to home theater than I knew before. Which one Um, is this? The VTF 15 H and they're out like V3 now it's, it is in a small room. And, and I, and I agree with these guys that are saying that if you really want to step up, you got to go to like an 18 to like a JTR or something like that, a ported 4,000 ULF or something, just knock your socks off. Yeah. But I, I consider that in my opinion, that or the rhythmic F15 HP, those are kind of the entry level, in my opinion, like top tier subwoofers that really, that really will impress your guests. Like the, the, and, and I, and I'd put SB16 in that class because most people who have ever gone to a theater that don't have the R level experience are like, wow, that is an amazing sub. I mean, realistically, that's that's true. Yeah. So the reason I would say HSU maybe or SVS is because you can get two of those HSU 15 VTF 15 H's for less money, for yeah. about 500 less money than one SVS. All right, mm-hmm. I'm going to throw a wrench in here. What about yeah. the Stark buy one, get one promotion? Yeah, I mean, I four of them. I haven't seen that one played its outputs, but you know that local has it. Keith has one and and the, a pair, and we liked it, Ryan. So, you know, that's $1,000 for two 15s in a sealed box with a 900-watt amp, if I remember right. That's not a bad choice that's either. four mm-hmm. subs for $2,000. bucks. hmm Corner load them. What about this question, or not question, but this statement? So, Benny, you know, he says two-shoe 15s. Hits pretty hard, but it's no 18. Technically, true. there's more surface area on dual 15s and a single 18. Yes, but I think he's saying one to one. Okay. I mean, we're talking a lot of different subs here and those are great entry subs, but they don't hold the candle to the JTR. Yeah. And what that driver can do. I think he was just saying as far as output. Yeah, so. I would agree. I think yeah. SVS has got SVS used to be on the same. And guys, I like SVS. I, I do too. I turned my camera off cause I'm eating, but I really like SVS, but they used to be on a similar price point to what Rhythmic is. And now I'm looking at Rhythmic's website mm-hmm. and I can buy an F18 for 1800 mm-hmm. yeah. bucks or the FV18 for 2100 bucks. Mm-hmm. And I can get the G25 HP, which is enormous for as much as the PB16. Yeah. So I'm popping this one up because it's related to what we're talking to right now. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So 
the answer to this one is a clear no. And I can point you to multiple subwoofer shootouts that will tell you that, um, that, at, that seat and sound, they had a bunch of the submersive HPs and that's mm-hmm. probably what you're talking about here. And like, I don't know, half a dozen different subwoofer shootouts I went to in 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And there were all kinds of different things in there, including uh, PB 13s at the time. Cause SVS didn't have their PB-16, mm-hmm. but consistently in every single shootout except for one, and these were comparing like eight subwoofers, six subwoofers, 10 subwoofers, mm-hmm. consistently that, that seat and sound won first place every single contest, even over JTR, except for one where the JTR captivators beat the seat and sound. So you already have a really good setup in that seat and sound. I'll tell you, I'll tell you just straight like this. That's a really nice setup. Yeah, the the HGS 18s. So that was Velodyne's like Mac Daddy man. That's for sure. That was back in the day. I don't know. Velodyne's one of the weird companies right now. They're kind of still in business, which they are. They got new ownership, but I don't know if they're like manufacturing brand new HGS 18s. I'm assuming they are. Um, but that was a beast back in the day, man. We Holy talked about it in the last couple of podcasts that they're still alive. What what do they charge for theirs these days? Do we know? I don't know if they even have pricing on their website. Too much. Looks like from a reseller, it's forty seven hundred bucks. So yeah, Ryan's Ooh, right. Too much. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a lot. That's a lot. All right, All right I'm done stuffing my face. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. So here's a good question since we're talking about subwoofers, and we'll get to our question tonight, guys. Don't worry. CJ says, "So what about the Clips RP sixteen hundred SW? I don't see anybody talking about that. Is it not a good sub?" Not even seeing reviews of them as well. Yeah, great question. I think the biggest thing is they haven't sent very many out. Um, I know I was on the list for, well, since they announced it. I'm like, hey, send me one. I'd love to review it. And they're like, yep, you're on the list. Well, that was, what, a year ago? Um, We had to buy one last year for M-Wave. And it did very, very well. And blind comparison. A lot of people wrote down in their notes, even myself included. I'm like, dude, this thing sounds clean. It's hitting, you know, significantly pretty low, a um, lot of output. And we were in a big old room. Um, and really, the in my notes, my personal notes, and I didn't know which ones were playing, the only two that kind of bested it, and I mentioned that, I think, today in a post on YouTube, was the uh, JTR RS1 and the big, massive, <laughs> dual GSG, I think, 21-inch mm-hmm. drivers. Um, so it, it fared very well. It actually is a quite nice sub, but again, I just don't think that they've sent them out to many people. So we don't know. I think if it was a bad sub, people would be grabbing onto (laughs) it all day long and talking about it. Well, everybody was saying up front, they're like, look, man, you got to prove yourself because you've kind of stunk it up for the past. How many years? Your subwoofers haven't been that great. I mean, the only subwoofer that clips made that I thought was really great was a really old one. It's about 15 years old now. It's the RSW15. I had four of them. Great sub. Now, when it hit 20 hertz, that jugger was like a a cliff. I mean, it dropped off fast, so you don't get any output below 20. But, man, mid-bass slam, it was great. Had great, great handling. Um, Really nice-looking sub. It had a 15-inch active on the rear, 15-inch passive on the front. Really solid, but... They just haven't really produced. They they kind of mass marketed them, and they had a lot of amp failures. But now they put, I think it's a man. I'm having to remember now. I think it's a ten year warranty. Maybe mm-hmm. they increased right? the warranty and they increased the yeah. wattage. I think on the amplifier. Yeah. So they they're they're willing to at least get beh- get behind this product and saying, look, guys, we heard the cry. We want to compete in this space. We know we've kind of slacked off, but we want to make something that's that's kind of a worthy contender of some of the other um kind of like their competitors out there so but but yeah i haven't seen much on them as well so kind of surprised so speaking we're staying on the sub train i have a feeling this is going to be a long stream <laughs> we may have to save our <laughs> questions next week. it's all good since you guys are surrounded by great subs all the time what makes the jtr always come out on top mm. the driver they're they're almost like almost undestroyable you know it's, like you know you don't hardly ever hear any i don't think i've ever heard anybody say 
yeah, man, I played that edge of tomorrow and it just smoked it. <laughs> you know, it can handle crazy output. It digs ridiculously deep. I mean, most of them are tuned at like 10 Hertz. So mm -hmm. they're capable of that kind of out of the box. I mean, without room gain with room gain, I'm getting down to five Hertz in my room and then it drops off really quick. But I wonder uh, if I can share this picture. The other, the other thing is the amount of excursion that driver can do. I think it's over 30 millimeters, which is enough that if you got in front of it when it was moving at a low frequency, it would hurt mm -hmm. if it hit yeah. you. Uh, yeah, Rob says, wife acceptance factor is an issue. Most big subs are ugly. It's true. So there's some pretty subs. But the, the JTR-18 isn't all that big. I think it's like 21 by 21 by RS one's not that big. 14. The 4,000 ULF. Is Sorry. A, the RS one. Yeah. Bridge. The 4,000 is enormous. Okay. Yeah, Let's a, not. Yeah. I hide bodies in my, yeah. In my theater. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Frank, Frank V. Great question, man. Five Hertz at what SPL? I, I'll have to go back to the thing, the video. I've got one on the channel and I don't even think I have reached max um, compression. I think I ran out of room, like volume on the, or trim level in the, uh, if I remember correctly, I was using the HTP one from Monoprice and I literally hit a ceiling. And so I could have turned up the gain on the subwoofer to see where I hit compression, but I just ran out of room and I had, it was a hundred and probably 105 DB at five Hertz. That's plenty for me. Um, so but yeah, like I said, I, I should have went back there just to see. And maybe one day I just need to do it again because I haven't done that in a long time. I mean, the so. JTRs will do 110 hertz each sub by itself. 110, not 110 hertz, 10 hertz at 110 dB mm -hmm. roundabouts. Yeah. They're just yeah. on a different level than most other things, the JTR yeah. stuff. Not comes, saying there's not other good subs, but for the price point, it, they're, yeah. you can't beat them. Yeah, they have a great. very, very expensive driver. They have mm -hmm. a very high quality amp and that speaker power amp that actually delivers its over its rated bandwidth and through all frequencies. Um, and then, you know, the DSP design, the, the, the limiting that Jeff can plug in there to make sure it doesn't misbehave at its, mm -hmm. at its full limits, doesn't blow up like Michael suggested, yeah. um, is important too. So you got a, you got a six or seven hundred dollar driver where a lot of these competitors like SVS or HSU or those guys, Stark Sound, they're using a lot cheaper driver with less excursion capability, less power handling. On a yeah. video a couple days ago where James and Gene were talking about the subwoofer roundup that they did, um, Gene said, and James thought too, that the JTR driver is probably at or over a thousand dollars if you could buy one. Yeah. On just the the driver. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Jeff, I, when I interviewed him and he was showing me the drivers, he was showing me the crossovers that he puts in there. He showed me the coaxial driver, which is basically a tweeter and a mid-range in one unit. At that time, what was that, four, uh, three years ago? That driver alone for his tower speakers was $900 just for that mid-range and tweeter. Yep. 900 bucks. That was his cost, you know? And so he, he puts just really, really high end stuff in there. He says 36 millimeter excursion on the JTR 18. It's insane. You know, it's funny watching them move when you get down to really low frequencies. Yeah. But if anybody wants some four thousands, mine are going to be for sale. Cause I'm going sealed. Oh, you it's hear happening. that? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's five right, of them. Go. Holy cow, five of them talking about a never ending journey. Look, I told you it <laughs> never stops. Good gosh, <laughs> get Ryan up. This, this will go directly to Ryan. Oh, 10 hertz, God. 10 hertz wasn't enough. I got to dig lower, but you got to come pick them up because he ain't shipping them. Well, I'll ship them, but oh, they're yeah. not cheap to ship. How are you going to get them up those stairs? That's, That's what, what I want to ask. Man, I'm glad I don't live in Kansas. City. I'm just going to yell at them and hope they move themselves. <laughs> I mean, man, they came you down, they them out of the up. wall too. Not only the stairs, you got to <laughs> dig them out of the wall. Going down. Oh, I can pull them back and get them out. It's just they're. Okay. And speaking of, and I'll, just a little sales pitch on the the four thousands. They don't really act, in my opinion, like what you would think a normal sealed sub is because the port mm -hmm. tunes at like 
15 or 16 hertz. And I, mm-hmm. I've never noticed um, port shuffling in my room right. ever. So I don't think I've. Well, in all fairness, too, though, you have. Well, now you've got five. Five of them. So each one of them is having to play like less. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But even so when I had was, two, I never noticed any. Portion. And I never noticed it. But I'm just saying when you've got five, you know, even if you had five PB 16s, you probably wouldn't hear port jumping because they're just they're not having to play as hard. No. So I mean, they're playing. Changed. I can see the drivers and stuff. They're you get right up next to them. And I've had some guys like, oh, is this playing? And they move their ear down and then they freak out because they're now <laughs> deaf because of how much output was actually coming out of that sub. Yeah, um, I think that's going to run you a few bucks there, Schmuck. JT yeah, to Australia. Possible. I think they've shipped to Australia before. Yeah, that's man. Oh, you know what? They shipped to the Philippines. Yeah. Doug Kramer. I flew over there and filmed his home theater. So... And it's expensive, I'm sure. So what seals are you looking at, Ryan? I don't know yet. Okay. I mean, well, it's JTR or Sendo. Mm-hmm. Depends on how big I want the driver to be. Yeah. Sweet, man. You can make them chuff, Mark. You can make them chuff. Yeah, if you try. I mean, but you I've know, you'd be playing like a nine hertz, eight hertz, seven hertz test what t- test sweep and just our test tone and just pumping up the volume Frank, i don't want to reenact doug's experience and have drywall falling off my ceiling okay i <laughs> we're just gonna say that i've never had them chuff yeah all right so y'all ready for the question you want to do that one i think we're just going to go right back to subwoofers that's okay it doesn't matter to me we can save it till next week no we can i meant okay. with the question oh, I see. Oh, okay okay all right well, let's let's just hit it so what's one thing you wish you had learned earlier in your home theater journey? So looking back, you know, I mean, with mine in this home, I'm at what, 15 years, almost 15 years. But my home theater journey, like having my first surround sound system goes all the way back to Dolby Pro Logic days. And I had a Polk audio system. It was in a living room environment, just 5.1. Um, but even looking at your whole home theater journey, what do you wish you would have learned earlier in the, you know, I mean, fortunately now we've got YouTube, we've got podcasts, we've got education that we didn't have back then. We had websites that you had to go and just read articles. Maybe there were some bulletin boards back then. Um, you know, and then we got to Facebook, not Facebook, but we got to forums, you know, like the AVS forums. So that was really beneficial, but now there's just so much information out there. What do you wish you would have learned earlier in your journey? You're asking the question, so I'm going to make you I understand. Start. So come on, bring it. <laughs> well, what do you think? Well, what do you wish you would have learned? I'm going to make you start. I think, all right, looking back, one of the last things that I did was acoustic treatment. And I did it. And here's the reason. I always thought that that was snake oil. I don't know why. I just thought, I mean, that's dumb. You're sticking squares up against a wall. I mean, what's that do? I had no clue. And and again, it goes back to ignorance. It goes back to education. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what acoustic treatment did. I didn't know how bad four hard walls, a hard ceiling, how bad that echoes and how that echo impacts the dialogue, impacts the clarity, impacts, impacts, that's not even a word impacts the perception of um you know just just individual sounds and so if i could have like knowing what i know now if i were to go and start over i would have started with the room i would have gotten the room sounding good and then build my system around it because along the way like you said i bought things thinking that i needed something better but I might have been okay enjoying what I had if my room sounded better. You know, I bought a mm-hmm. bigger center channel because I thought, oh, I just can't hear it that good. It sounds muffled. Well, it might have sounded a whole lot clearer if I would have had some, you know, acoustic treatment in the room. So I think, I think for me, it would be start with the room, you know, um, 
you know, especially if you're building a room, you've got unlimited possibilities there. Get it right. Do some research. Find out what room dimension. Don't build a don't build a 20 by 20 room. That'd be pretty bad, you know. Um, but get the room acoustics right and maybe even hire somebody to design the room and make sure that it's going to be acoustically correct. There's things like standing waves. And if you're building a room, you can figure out, okay, where should I put my theater seats and where shouldn't I? Cause if I put them here, I'm going to be in a null all the time and I'm going to be fighting that null. And part of my room, my issues, I don't have the luxury of moving my seats because my room's only 13 by 19. My front cabinet's four feet. So effectively I've got about 13 by 15 foot of space to work with with seating and I've got two rows of seats. So, I mean, it's my front row is where it is. I can't change it. And I know that I'm sitting in a null. And so how I compensate that is because the JTR RS2s have so much output for my room, I'm able to back that output down. So if I've got a dip here, I just make my house curve where the bottom of the dip is. And so that's where I'm still flat to five Hertz at 105 dB. If I didn't have that null, I could be up to about, I don't know, 120 dB at five Hertz. So, which I don't need, but so, yeah, so that's, that's my, probably the one thing that I wish I would have learned earlier is that the room matters. The acoustics matter. Um, and not that you've got to spend a fortune. You can build those super cheap. Jonathan's got some really inexpensive ones right behind his head. Um, but, but you got to have something you can't just have blank walls, blank ceiling, and just have it echoing like crazy and go, man, my, my system sounds great. Cause you're really, really missing out. You really are. All right. Your turn. Jonathan. <laughs> Look no, at Ryan, I, man. He's passing the buck tonight. He's like, I ain't talking. I struggle a little bit with this question because I feel like everything that I've purchased poorly has been a learning experience for me. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've figured out where to go next from there. So like you talked about, we went through all these different systems as we've kind of climbed the ladder, so to speak. And each one of those, you kind of learn which direction you want to steer for the next mm -hmm. upgrade. Without that knowledge, how would you even know? And I might... Me, Jonathan, prefer something than Ryan does, and we both had our own little paths, you know? Like, he yeah. he loves a speaker I wouldn't pick, and I love a speaker he wouldn't pick. So I, we can't just, like, have somebody shortcut all that stuff. you got to kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that there's something that I would say. I spent years, literal years, trying to figure out why my center channel stunk. And um, tr I went through five or six different uh, horizontal center channels trying to figure out, like, why does it sound muffled? Why can't mm -hmm. I get past this? Sure. And so the answer is you can't horizontal center channels, the MTMs with like a, just a two-way speaker. You, you can't get there for the most part. Yeah. Um, so don't do it. Don't waste, <laughs> don't waste your time trying to chase that down. If you can get uh, a vertical, go with it, man. Yeah. Identical or, or try to get, you know, like the two and a half or three-way center channel. If you must have a horizontal center channel, but don't, yeah. don't keep spending money on those two-way center channels and hope you're going to get mm. what you want. Cause it doesn't happen. Um, and then I think another thing that I sort of wasted time in, but I, it's another one that I feel like I learned a lot with, and it kind of made me more knowledgeable of the hobby in general, is my chasing of amplifiers or pre-pros uh, at some points throughout time. You know, like you read this flowery language on the different yeah. review sites, like this really made me hear things I've never heard before. And I want that, you know, so you buy that and then you're like, I don't hear any difference. Yeah. <laughs> Brought to you by your local AV dealer. Yeah. yeah. So I've been guilty of that kind of stuff a lot over the years and, and to my own pocket, but detriment, but again, at the same time, get my measuring equipment. I start measuring the stuff out. I start doing frequency response plots and doing like some, uh, voltage testing and stuff. And I'm starting, you know, I realize along the way that that's all nonsense. I wouldn't have known it was all nonsense if I hadn't, you know, tested it myself. So there's, there's education that was had and I enjoy that. So, yeah. But if you could so pick I, one piece of that, so both of ours kind of comes back to education, whether it's personal experience education mm -hmm. or learning about something you didn't know. Mm -hmm. What were you saying, Ryan? I was going to say, if is there a certain piece of that that you would find indispensable that you wish you would have learned earlier? No, I mean, the, the one that I kept beating my head against the wall was that center channel speaker. I mean, I literally, I would go six months and I would buy a different one and then I would, you know, like try 
try these different brands, m- matching the speaker line, switching speakers out, trying the center and the center channel that matched that. Nothing ever worked until I actually just went to an upright center channel or a you know a high efficiency speaker. Either way, to where I was happy with the center channel sound that didn't sound muffled like they were talking through a tin can or you know lead filled can. Yeah. And we're talking about high volumes, fellas. I'm not talking about like. It's background music or something. That's fine on a little horizontal twinner. But if you want to turn it up to like THX reference volumes, you want to have commercial cinema volumes, those mm-hmm. MTMs can't do it. They just can't. They don't sound good on your oh, commercial volume. Vo- no, they can't. No way. But then you run into other problems too, like traditional soft dome tweeters and other things that are used in a lot of those products. It's not, I wouldn't say it's all just based on the design. There's other things that come into that, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're, right. you're absolutely right design limitations the drivers that are used on the consumer side for sure play into that yep Yep. so what would i do i think my biggest one is uh understanding eq and measurements when i'm looking at them because if i would have understood that a long time ago Mm -hmm. and i would have been measuring things right and i think not saying anything bad about your situation, Jonathan, but if I would have known measurements, then I could have looked at that and then looked at the center channel and the measurements and probably been like, oh, this sucks. And maybe gone down a rabbit hole of why does this suck and how can I fix these? And maybe it would have brought me upon some enlightenment of, oh, well, an MTM center channel isn't necessarily the greatest thing in the world. So to me, measurements would have fixed a lot of things for me. Like, why does my room sound like crap? Why does my bass sound boomy? Why does it sound, why do my ears hurt? So being able to measure those things and understand when I'm looking at a um, decay waterfall chart or a frequency response or any of that stuff, it would have saved me a lot of pain, anguish, mm-hmm. and money. So being yeah, I able to get to at the the lowest fundamental level and understand what I'm looking at would have been very helpful. And also understanding that the room was a bigger part of it than I thought it was. I think you almost have to become like a novice or mid-tier type enthusiast before you would start considering buying a microphone. But I would agree that if you could start there more, if, if people would yeah. be willing to learn it and start there, they could save themselves a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. But you could start with education before you're going down the rabbit hole of buying a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And just learning mm-hmm. what a frequency response is. What is a good frequency response? What are room modes? Things like that. that. If you're not spending money, it's not any fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness, man. Uh... What do you think, chat? What would you? I saw some answers in here yeah, a little bit. I'll put, I'll put a couple of them up. I started them. Um, yeah. So Aaron says, just listening to and visiting as many home uh, different rooms as possible before building my own um, acoustic treatments as well. Jr. says, I wish I knew about room modes and sitting positions. I would have started by placing the seat in the correct place and then designing the room around it as much as possible. Uh, I think there was a maybe the manufacturers that. make this as convoluted as possible. So we buy multiple things along the journey. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's a prime example. Tyler says uh, home dinner in a box wasn't as awesome as the box said. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, that's, that's a good point. I know it, man. It's all marketing. So yeah. Room treatments and EQ. Brad says I would have gotten a higher ceiling in my basement. Charles. Do it. I had to buy a different house, probably, unless you built it, because some things are snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> Mikey says the box was nice. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think that was most of them. I'm trying to see. Uh, okay. Uh, Robert says for me, it was magazines about home theater where I learned back in the Dolby Pro Logic days. Then Dolby Digital, then DTS, then working in an audio video store. Got to experience the new gear. Sure. So again, it kind of goes back to education, the experience. Uh, got Aaron's. Yeah. Hardeep uh, Singh says, if you can move the seat, it does make a huge difference. 
Yeah, it can make all the difference. I mean, you can position your seats in a place that is gives you the best response in your room. Let's see if there's anybody else up here. Yeah, got that one. Cool. I like it, man. Good discussion. <laughs> what? That grandma doesn't know what she's talking about. Oh, dear. I love it. Oh, wow. Would have bought a different wife. Mercy. I don't know where we're going with this chat. You guys are cracking me up. <laughs> <clears throat> mm, that's a good one. I'm going to star that for later. Yeah. All right. Cool. I like that. Good discussion, man. It's Let only me... 40 questions right now. Yeah, that's good. We got a super oh chat. Let me let me drop that. We'll we'll start blazing through these. Blazing. There's no oh, blazing in this. I'm gonna hit it. Hi, finest. Appreciate the ten dollars super chat. Going from dual SB16s to dual RS1s. If you EQ to the same target curve and cut both off at 15 hertz, why would you do that? But let's say you did 24 dB octave and typically play content at negative 15 dB. Would you experience anything different? I mean, he's not utilizing the really low frequencies that the um, RS1s are capable of. <clears throat> You'd probably like the dual PB16s. Oh, wait, they're both duals. Never mind. I was going to say if it's dual SP16s versus one, you might like the dual better, but it's both dual. Yeah. I'm looking My opinion at is you wouldn't tell much difference at the low volume. In the subwoofer shootouts we've done, many of them over the years, some of them blind even, <clears throat> you only really start noticing the differences in that stuff at the extreme limits of their volume abilities or their excursion handling, their amp handling, like just basically the upper limits. So if you're playing it in their comfortable range, they're all going to be low distortion. Those are both good quality like setups. So if you're not pushing the limits, they'll be pretty now, close. I find is my question is, are you using that cutoff um, at 15 Hertz because the other one isn't capable of it? That because we be know the SB16 can't handle that below that. And so you're saying, hey, I don't want you to play this because you're oh not my. really affected there. That's that's sealed box 16. It can handle 15. It no, can. He, but he's saying he cuts it. He like cuts it off. So he his logic here is if I cut the RS1s off at 15 hertz, my question is why would you do that? He's Bradley's trying to ask. He's trying to ask the question of: Would there be a sonic difference between the subs right. if they were only capable of playing the same frequency? Yeah. Uh, my my answer would be yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so why though? Even at I low think volume? there's a, I think there's a difference between drivers. I've done enough. I mean, think about the speaker comparison test, especially mm -hmm. if you get into the higher frequencies. I think you're going to be able to tell a difference. On what you like maybe i mean the the subs in the sub suit out sounded different that is true they were placed differently yeah in the exact also, same place over yeah. and over and over again well, we'll do, i'm gonna do that next year and i'm betting they're gonna sound different i i don't think so uh not i for speakers absolutely with subs that hasn't been my experience they sound they sound a little different but not You'd have you'd be hard pressed to identify which is which. And I'll tell you why. We did a subwoofer shootout in 2014, I think it was. We did a blind subwoofer shootout. We had eight brands in there. We had people in there that were strictly myself, one of them. I love ported subwoofers. I like it more than horn. I like it more than sealed. Other people saying I love sealed subwoofers. I love it more than everything else. These are enthusiasts, the kind that would travel all over the United States to come to our shootout. Mm -hmm. Blind shootout, not playing at the limits. People didn't even know it was playing. Like they couldn't identify ported versus sealed. Mm -hmm. we weren't pushing it we were just setting it in the exact play, same place and letting it go and the and the results were all over the place like people couldn't identify what they thought was their absolute favorite so that's the experience but i'm drawing from identify what conclusion. you thought was your absolute favorite are you saying i wouldn't be able to identify a ported versus sealed because i don't think yeah. i'd be able to do that yes. all i'm simply saying is is that they'll sound there will be some sonic differences you can you can absolutely tell the differences if you push them to their limits but if they're both comfortably within their means, their distortion levels are really low. They're not pushing hard. They're in the exact same place. You're not talking about room modes or anything like that. As long as they're really close to the same placement, you'd be a hard pressed. You'll be surprised. If you do that next well, year in M-Wave, you'll be hard pressed. 
to tell the difference. It's, it doesn't even sound logical. I was on the thing. I was on the fence thing and I will absolutely be able to tell this. I love poured subs. I couldn't tell. No, mm. I, I agree with that. I guess. Yeah. You're probably right. If you're talking about like just cruising along. Yeah. You're not going to be really be able to tell in that. And he's saying negative segment. 15. That's not super loud. He's not pushing them hard at all. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Usually a lot of times. But between the two, the JTR and the in the SVS at ten hertz, there is a ten dB difference. Yeah, which is enormous. No comparison there. You turn it up to say negative five, you're going to start being able to separate them out. And when you mm -hmm. start, because it, if you look at those distortion plots, and we can't look at it anymore, but database shows it. <clears throat> those distortion plots go from really low numbers on like a sealed sub to almost okay. like 30 percent distortion as they near the limits and that 16 mm -hmm. is going to near its limits much faster than 18 inch drivers mm -hmm. just the nature of the physics of it sure so as you start getting those volumes that sb16 is going to start crying uncle first you're going to hear that that's going to be 30 percent distortion is audible mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna know before it ever makes like a bad mechanical noise before it like you know makes a metal on metal sound it's going to sound bloated heavy like slow it's going to sound like it's not it's not performing properly and you've just hit the limits of the driver, but, but it, but within their limits, two sealed drivers, good luck, man. Unless you just get something super cheap and junky that has an undersized magnet or wrong dampening for the cabinet, as far as airspace and the QMS is all wrong and all that kind of stuff. You, you could probably get a $15 driver that would make a difference. But if you get competent drivers, you play them below their means. Good luck. Yeah, I'd agree. I agree. You're about to say you could get a 15 inch dri $15 driver and it'd be sounding good. I'm like, what? Mm -mm, but mm -mm. You got it. I was like, man, where's Jonathan going with this one? It just went south. Really no, I'll, I'll, let me link that thread in private chat, and you should put it out for your audience. It's a super good read. We were really scientific about it and had some really good subs and some cheap ones in there. You yeah. could rate them in tiers, and the tiers came across based on performance levels. So as we turned it up, you could say, mm -hmm. like, all right, we know the Seton and the JTR. Those are in that top tier because they're not making bad sounds anywhere. Yeah. Um, and the HSU and the SVS and, you know, uh, well, some of the other brands, I can't remember them all right now. Mm -hmm. They were starting, they were bowing out a little bit earlier than the JTR and the Seton. So, okay. you know, that's how we were distinguishing them. Not so much that mm -hmm. people with these super thoughtful preferences that they came into it thinking they could know this. They didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't. And that's one thing I love about your community in Kansas City is that you got, I mean, this is what you live and breathe. That's what's so unique about your community there. It's unfortunate that, for our spouses. Yeah. But you're willing to put things, you're willing to put aside your biases to measure things objectively, to do blind A-B comparisons. And, and again, that's some of the things that we want to incorporate and have been incorporating in the M-Wave because we want to, um, let me drop this in the chat here for you guys. Uh, so this is blind subwoofer. Yeah, I even said subwoofer, Jonathan. You impressed? Subwoofer. <laughs> Shoot out. Uh, all right. All right. I'll drop that in the chat. Here. Oh, wow. Such a dingling. Did I drop it in the chat or did I drop? I think I just dropped it in our private chat. That's exactly what I did. One dingling. Try that again. This is a good read for, read for anybody interested in subwoofers. Subwoofer. Um, subwoofers. We had wow. a Chase Home Theater 18, a JTR cap sealed, Seton submersive, MFW 15, do it yourself, dual opposed, HSU v VTF 15H, JTR mm -hmm. Captivator Pro, JTR Orbit Shifter. Those were the Orbit Shifter. Those were the ones that were in that contest. Yeah. Schmock Minson, it's like with the nice higher end subs, they seem to have limiters built in. He said he pushed his F. The 15 HP too hard when doing compression testing, and it actually did a good job at limiting the output. And so it has some internal, and I think the JTR, if I remember talking to Jeff, he's got some, I don't know what you call it, whether it's a limiter or some DSP in there that says, hey, if things start getting squirrely, we're going to throttle it back a little bit to keep it from getting out of control and sounding nasty. Is that correct? Yeah, and Rhythmic's got that servo control on their driver, that 15H as a as a servo driver. So it's mm -hmm. it's designed to if the if the amp's calling for this and the drivers perform out of spec, that servo motor is like doing a health check on it effectively and saying you're like you're not performing in my specs, back down. Yeah. And so that FV 15 HP is a really hard driver to make sound bad. Like they mm -hmm. that technology does really good at its limits. 
Why do I have balloons? I love these, man. I don't Here's understand. <laughs> what is happening? You know it's what? OBS and I don't get it. I Why do I you. have balloons? Look, I can tell you right now what it is. OBS is excited that you're excited. No. Like you're smiling and it's like, dude, no. we're going to celebrate tonight because Ryan's taking, happy. It's taking it away from me. <laughs> happy birthday, uh, no. Hardy. It's not my birthday. I don't OBS understand what's really, happening. That's funny, man. I love it. I love it. Joe Wires. All right. Honest question here. Appreciate the $10 super chat. Michael, can you give the honest poo poo? I love that. On the Rvolution player, seems super laggy in your videos, loading movie posters. So, yes, it loads those. So originally, when I saw the demo at Cedia, loaded real quick as far as scrolling. And I noticed that immediately. I'm like, wow, this thing's blazing fast. When I had the um, Zapiti, you can click as fast as you can and it would go page one, page two, page three. And I mean, I'm clicking as fast as I can with the new one, the Rvolution, you can hold it down and it literally from top to bottom, it will scroll extremely fast. But I had somebody ask in my comments, they said, hey, Michael, I noticed it scrolled fast, but what about load times on the actual artwork? And so I said, you know, great question. Let me go back and let me just kind of do some testing on that. So I started at the top, gave it a little bit to let it load. And I noticed as I scroll through, it took it a little bit to load. Um, so it definitely, I remember talking with Raphael and he said they are working like that's a priority for them. They know that they need to speed that up. Um, and then I was talking with Ryan backstage even about that. And he's thinking that he had a conversation with Raphael that they may not actually right now be loaded and I'll, I'll confirm this with Rafael. I'll send him an email tonight um, to see, are they physically loading that currently with the Rvolution from the hard drive or, or maybe internal storage or memory, or is it still at least currently being, um, is it pulling that data from their server? Cause if it is, then that makes sense why it's loading uh, slower. But if it's if it's somewhere on the drive, like your own hard drives or on the unit itself in memory or something, if it's still loading slow because of that, um, you know, but that but he did assure me and I put it in my video. I did a, a follow up video to that. So if you guys haven't seen that, go check it out if you're interested in something like a. Um, it's a not media. locally caching yet. Yeah. So, so that was what conversation did you have? Did you talk to Raphael about that? Uh, before you got there, I asked him and he said the local caching isn't there yet. So the reason it's taking mm -hmm. a while is is because it's having to query their web database and then it's getting them pulling them down and then putting them on. So there's no local cache. Once they get their local cache, you won't have that problem anymore. It'll okay. instantly load. So here's what I will do. If if Raphael says, hey, look, we're working on that, because I know he already told me we're working on making it faster. He just didn't tell me that it's currently not stored on the device, but that's where they're headed. I know that's where they want to be, whether it is now currently or not. Uh, that I don't know. Ryan says that it's not right now. But if that's the case, once it does get faster, then I'll definitely make a follow-up video and say, okay, here's where we're at now. Uh, Arvolution mentioned that they've made these changes whatever those are and they've either implemented a firmware update or they're now storing them locally on the the uh the player or your hard drives so uh, i was looking at some of the chat but you're testing the rvolution over usb hdd correct yeah so i have an external actually let me put your um comment up here so everybody can see it uh, right here. So Mikey says, but you're testing the Rvolution over USB HDD, correct? So yeah, so I have an external hard drive connected to USB 3.1. Uh, he said, there's likely a difference between that and an installed hard drive over six gigabyte per second SATA. So would that, I mean, would those files really be that, you know what I'm saying? Would that make that much difference? And again, I don't know where they're, I haven't confirmed yet where they're either going to store that data or currently storing that data because they may have somewhere actually on the unit that that information is being stored. I don't know. So that'd be a good question for me to ask Raphael if he can clarify that. Uh, so Randy says, yep. So external USB might be part of the issue uh, versus internal hard drive. 
can't fathom why they would do that. Old firmware, probably that could be too. So yeah. So we don't know at this point. It's still, I mean, they just started shipping these. I would love to see them get that faster, but that's my honest opinion. I, if they can get that faster, I love the interface. I like what we have. It looks a lot cleaner. Um, but yeah, but they definitely need to get that faster. And they know, he said, this is priority for the team. So it's pulling the entire directory off the USB again. I don't know, Mikey, if that's the case. That was literally in my video. It was kind of an assumption. I assumed that that's, it was storing it somewhere on my hard drive. But what was interesting, and it kind of, it makes sense that it may not physically be there is because on the local drive, there is a, a dot rvolution folder. And if you go into that dot rvolution folder, there's literally one file. It's a dat file. So there's no artwork. There's no JPEGs. There's no any of that. So none of those files are actually on my hard drive that I can see. So uh, let's see, is Arvolution staff the same as Zipedi? Not all, but there definitely were some from the Zipedi company. They had some issues over there and some of the guys said, look, we're out. And they're like, you know what? You guys have kind of run that company into the ground. We're going to build a new one. Uh, we've got a great product. We think we can improve it. So they came up with a new app and that app is actually going to be available for the Dune, the Zipedi owners, and, and guys, the guys, players. the reason they went out of business is not because of the the NAS. It has nothing no. to do with that. So no, I, I need that. I need to encourage people to not constantly grasp onto that and the things that happened with, um, you know, the products that they were releasing and the things that they were doing. That's not why things went the way yeah. they did. So don't worry about that. Yeah. It's um. The product's good. I've seen it. I've got one here. Um, sold a couple. I need to dig through it. But I really like it. So I, the thing that I'm excited about, and I think Zito could do this too, but as a Plex replacement is that the Arvolution can do ISO, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. I mean, being able to do full ISOs and not have to like rip and then um, do a remux. I mean, I that's big for me. So if it can do ISOs, that'll be, that'll be great. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Randy, a bit of a disappointment that the displayer is 900 and it's not, or it's a 900 and it's not also a displayer. Mm -hmm. So there is talking to Raphael. There is a cheaper version supposedly coming that is not going to have built in, um, hard drive, hard drive space, but I don't know when that's coming. Okay. So anyway. I know Ryan Ryan mentioned this as far as this. Um, Jed, they had legal issues in the U.S., but all they did was say, okay, no problem. We won't sell it in the U.S. We'll continue to sell it in other countries that it isn't illegal to do that. And so that, like Ryan said, that wasn't the issue. No. They, you know, that was no big deal with the, they basically just fought it saying, hey, look, we should be able to sell it in the U.S., but when it came down to it, and they said, no, we won't allow you to. They're like, fine. They just pulled it. So it wasn't a big deal. They didn't get any trouble as far as that's concerned. But but yeah, it wasn't because of that. Uh, and like I said, you can see that with the new R Revolution. They're still selling the NAS in other countries. They just can't sell it in the U.S. So, uh, da, 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 da. okay. Any bit of fits to the R Revolution versus a competent home theater PC build? I don't think so. Um, it's going to be a different user interface, you know, with a HCPC, you're going to be using something like Plex. You might be using what's the other one? Cody, there's Cody. Uh, you might be using Cody. So those are just different interfaces. I just think they're, they're more complex to set up. So if you're, if you're a tinker and you like building and you like configuring it, I don't necessarily think that, okay, there's going to be this massive difference. Something like the R Revolution, I kind of equate it to maybe the difference between, let's say, for instance, um, well, kind of like Kaleidoscape versus Plex. You know, if you want to dive into it and figure it out and build a PC and rip all your media, you know, great. If you can do a one to one copy, you're going to get a great, 
um, performance out of building your own PC. Cloud Escape just makes it simpler. And I think the same thing with Arvolution and these other players, the do, Dune, they just make it easier. They've already got the interface. Um, you don't have to configure much. It just works. So he, Joe says, I rip everything to ISO. Took two minutes to know MKV was too much to get subs right. Would have taken years to get through them all. Zadu is so far. Yeah. Yeah. See, ease and ease of use and maintenance. So yeah. I think that's really what it comes down to. It just depends on what your preference is. The longer I'm in this space, the more I care about ease of use hmm. and for it just to work. But the longer, when I first started, I'm like, oh, I will maintain my own stuff. And now it's like, uh, no. Okay. But to work. Think about when you first started, were you at the same financial level as you are now? Even if I wasn't, I would have chosen pro products like a an Arvolution or a Zidu over potentially Plex because it mm -hmm. was just easier. I mean, the mm -hmm. times where I'm traveling and my wife just says, Plex doesn't yeah. work. I yeah, mean, it, I just want things not only for myself, because even if I know how to do it, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the rest of my family is going to know how to do it. And yeah. if they can't interact with it or know how it works, they're no, not I, going to use it. No. So I really value simplicity for liability and ease of use all right i promised we would go through some stuff lightning around johnson shaking said like I ain't nothing lightning about this all right no, here we go i told you it's gonna be a long stream oh no, that's great and jonathan feel free if you got a jet just do a peace sign and then just hit the eject button uh bruce says sometimes even when i have my av receiver turned off my subwoofer makes a loud noise like it's receiving bass signals but it shouldn't be doing anything what could be the cause of this issue Is that a faulty amp? Like his you're, AV you're is muted, off, Jonathan. but yet he's hearing a noise. Yeah, un, un, unhook your RCA cable from the back of your sub, and you're probably not going to get that noise anymore, which would then indicate that your, uh, your RCA cable is picking up electrical noise from something that's crossing over. Maybe it's too close to an electrical cable or something like that. If your subwoofer is making noise when your RCA cable is unplugged, then you got an amplifier that's probably failing. Yep. Okay. Those are the two scenarios that that would be. Boom. That's it. Ardeep says, how can I get bass performance that irritates my neighbors <laughs> across the street or as a minimum that move their dishes causing them to fall? Man, you really got some love for your neighbors there, brother. I like Find it. my used captivators. You may oh, that'll do it. Down. Big subwoofers, <laughs> honestly. There's lots of good companies out there. Uh, iCape says, let's get this started right. What is your favorite Halloween candy? Mm, this right. could cause mine's a fight. Anything, mine's anything chocolate. I love chocolate. Anything? Come on favorite you just totally just went i'm not answering that question okay snickers i love snickers oh you stole my answer are we all snickers snickers, snickers. really that's yes. wild i used to eat a snickers all right oh, so when so i was good. a youth pastor i would buy candy for our youth ministry so You'd when take kids all the come snickers wouldn't you i'd go buy one every, <laughs> every day i'd go get a snickers and a coke and i did that for a long time I'm like dude you oh i it. thought you bought bags of candy and took all the snickers out no, 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 no. We would buy like full candy bars. So the kids, when they would come in, we had a snack bar. We weren't making any money. Um, Reese's for you, Snickers for me. Reese's for them. Yeah, Snickers we'd for sell. Me. Like every you know, time you give a kid something, you get one for yourself. Yeah, we'd sell, you know, Cokes for 50 cents. I think candy bars were 75 cents or something like that. We weren't trying to make any money. That was before they were $2.50 for a dang Snickers. Golly, <laughs> what did the world come to? Probably why I don't need them anymore. Uh, Dev says, hello, I'm new to home theater. Welcome in. Uh, can a 11 by 14 be made as a media room? Man, that's an awesome question. And the answer is 1,000%. Absolutely. No, the minimum room tour. size is 20 by 30. I did a home theater tour one time. Check it out on my channel. If you search for youth man, Harry Potter, this guy. I remember that a, video. It was, it was probably about 12 foot. Okay, so it's smaller than your room. I think it was like 12 by 12, 12 by 13, something like that. It was a bedroom setup. You walk in, you have no clue this thing is not a dedicated. I mean, you you had no clue it was a um, a bedroom. You really walk into a dedicated theater room. He had a 120-inch screen. He had an 18-inch infinite baffle subwoofer up front. So the back side of the subwoofer was in the adjacent room. 
He had two 15s in the back, four theater seats, wall to wall. You couldn't get behind the seat. You had to move the seat to get back there to the rack. I mean, it was, it was tight. Imagine dude, not having a box that. fan as a child and just having your dad's infinite baffle just ah. bumping in your room. So yeah, dude, hundred percent. So I've been a big advocate since I started my channel. Use whatever space you have. If it's a bonus room, a guest room, a bedroom, a living room, um, a, uh, yeah, I said the bonus room, wherever, man, make it happen. I've seen people do sheds. You know, buy a shed and make a home theater. You can make some cool space, even with a small area. I'd love to have a bigger room, but I make it work. Schmuck says, what's your opinion on the buy once, cry once saying? I'll let you guys take this one. Once, cry once. I mean, you're going to buy again anyway. But anyway. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you don't have any experience, you buy once. You might not be done buying. So do your research. Then buy once, cry once. Yeah. Even yeah. then, I don't know that there's I'm a big a advocate of not cutting corners, but to save money, you ultimately have to figure out what's your long term goal. Where do you want to go? And if your long term goal is this up here, but your funds are here, either just wait, save up, go take out a second job, you know, delivering some pizzas, doing Uber. There's a lot of ways to earn some extra money. You can start a side hustle on TikTok, whatever. There's a lot of different ways. <laughs> I'm serious, man. You can garage sale, flip stuff. There's a million ways to save up some extra money to get you to whatever you're looking at. But I know my own self, the times that I said, you know what? I don't have the funds for this, so I'll settle for this every single time. I wanted this. I bought this. I got this, and I, did, I just wasn't satisfied with it. And so I ended up selling it, losing money buying this anyway. And so I ended up, it took me more time and I lost money on it. So I'm a fan of buy once, cry once, but know that you don't have to buy the most expensive thing to get an incredible system. But a lot of times not buying the best opens a gateway to then wanting the best. Mm -hmm. So you got to be careful about did I just not spend enough because I was trying to save money and then you end up selling it to buy the expensive thing anyway? But that's what I'm saying. Do your research, go hear some different, you know, home theaters, maybe in your area, come to M wave. Then you'll begin to figure out, okay, where, where is your end game? Where are you headed? Like what's your goals and what's your, your path towards that? What did Randy say? Ain't nobody going to see this or want to see this. I don't know what that means. Uh, let's see. All right. Mike says, does EQ help combat bad room acoustics? Not a good option. Uh, it can, but it's not it can a good help. Option. I can't watch live, but I'll catch the replay. Yeah. Ideally, man, measure your room, put some acoustic treatment. Here's what I tell people with mad VR. You can't fix physics with software. A lot yeah. of times yeah. you can kind of finagle it, but once mm -hmm. you hit the limitation, there ain't no going past that. Once you hit the limit of phys the physical constraints of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you got to fix it in the physical world. Otherwise, yeah. it ain't getting fixed. <clears throat> Icope says, enjoyed your video on preferred Atmos scene to demo. So I think that was the collaboration I did with Audio Advice. Mm -hmm. Any scenes in Top Gun Maverick that make your top five video was made before that release? Yeah. Um, Two minutes and 15 a, seconds. There's a bunch of scenes in Maverick. So, I mean, of course, the, the end fight scene or flight scene, even that when used, he's that used to be my favorite. But the one in K Scape that's literally called two minutes and 15 seconds, mm -hmm. where he's doing the to show Time the run. cadets, yeah, there is more bass in that than any scene than most scenes. Yeah. <laughs> any well, scene was a stretch, but I had to take that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where he flies the um, mm -hmm. I forget the Death Star. And it does it does some really cool uh, Atmos effects when he's rolling and the sound moves across the ceiling and back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a really good demo scene, I think. Yeah. Everybody likes the Mach Ten scene, but mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of dynamicness in that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one that just hits you. But the two minutes and fifteen seconds, it's intense. Did you just literally say dynamicness? Yes. 
Because <laughs> I make up words all the time too. So I just I didn't say it was a real word. I just what, what came out of my mouth. How's it like dynamic? Hey, what the heck is that? That's awesome. Well, man, we got 201 in the chat and watching live. If you're enjoying this, man, hit the like button. That definitely will help get it out to more people. It's obviously uh, Jonathan, do you have a favorite scene in Maverick? You know, I have I have it. I haven't watched it yet in my theater. <gasps> Man, you got to crank it up, dude. You've got such an incredible theater. Your family I just, I just haven't made it to it yet. It's on the list. Y'all saw it at the theater. Like yeah, I saw it several times at the theater. Oh, yeah. it's so much. It's, it's, it's a great, dude. I love it. Do you have it? I have it. I bought it in 4K. I just, I have something in me. I don't want to watch the same movie over and over again. Since I saw it two or three times in the theater, I was, I'm yeah. still like, still. Watch it. What about all the demo scenes? Uh, I watch those over and over again. Yeah, so just okay. cut some demo scenes and go at it. There you go. Uh, Tiki Time says, with winter coming up, any home theater upgrade project for the three amigos? Jonathan, you got anything coming up? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the wood color. Back here. I just got to do something with that riser and make it not just plain wood. That's really all what I got to do. What about just some carpet? Would yeah, I've thought mm -hmm. about that. So either I do I make it the same color as my white carpet or do i make it black in anticipation of changing my future carpet black because i black, i don't uh, want to have white carpet forever so I'm yeah that makes sense hmm. black yeah that'd be all black. right if it, again you're going long term you know where your vision is mm -hmm. so if you're building that to work with this future carpet why not save you money time and money mm -hmm. you don't want to put carpet on it buy that spend time doing it then rip it off throw it away put new one on there down the road mm -hmm. Black. I think black would be cool. It's worth to have the difference now than to have to redo it later. So yeah. before I do that, one of the reasons I'm holding off, and maybe we'll figure this out with Sheldon instead of me, I want to try the Den and, and Marantz's capability of having four uh, subs front yeah. and four subs rear, and I want to do two in each corner. So I want to try the four corners setup. And mm -hmm. if, if I like that better, then maybe the near field go away and this seat, okay. this comes forward. Blasphemy! Maybe. Blasphemy. This and isn't gonna, Jonathan. This isn't like you. What has gotten into you? I'm gonna you make Jonathan? it. <laughs> I'm gonna make it where it will be like an open invite for the Kansas City folk. Maybe this winter sometime. Yeah. Uh where we can we can watch a clip. Maybe we'll even watch half like 30 minutes of uh, a movie one way, switch all the subs around, do the calibration, mm -hmm. or maybe I'll even set it up in advance potentially with speaker one and speaker two output, and then watch that same scene again and get some different opinions on it. There you go. Randy says paint it black now and then do the carpet with the rest of the room later. That's a good idea because you'd want it to be the same carpet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I got some sort of movie theater carpet or something and couldn't, it went out of stock, was no longer available or something, that'd be bad. Yeah. Am I doing anything this winter? The whole thing? The You're whole redoing thing. the whole thing? The whole thing? Yeah. The are you still moving thing. or are you not moving? No, no. We got priced out of that. You just they wanted two hundred thousand dollars just for the foundation in that room. Why? Not that even to finish it. Gone to a different builder or something. That sounds crazy. Yeah. Well, then it was just it didn't make a lot of financial sense. I mean, we got a two percent mortgage rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that the mortgage rate. You, you know, you date your mortgage rate. You marry, marry the house. So it's. I wasn't concerned about that, but it was just it makes more sense to just stay here. I'm trying to finagle some stuff and gain some room back in my ceiling. We're going to demo the whole room. Like it's going to be jackhammered out like chirpy. Uh, so the problem with doing that, <laughs> it, I thought about benching. The problem with doing that is my room isn't as wide as chirpies. So if I bench, I'm going to lose one to two feet on all sides. And with the seating position, my room isn't wide enough to recover that. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I've got to talk to some people and try and figure out what to do. I've got, I know what speakers I'm doing. So it's, that's Are you happening. doing Black Swan? We're doing Black Swans. <laughs> happening. I just, the P10s over here solidified it. I mean, when I was doing those comparisons, yeah. it's, that's happening. So now it's just trying to figure out, like, what am I doing with the room? What direction am I going? I'm going to do, I'm, doing an acoustically transparent screen. You guys are like, you need to do this. I'm doing it. Um, we're getting rid of the bar in the back. We're going to do a huge baffle wall. So it's 
it's happening. I mean, and it's not going to be modeling. And you think you're going to have the? Well, I guess you got time. You got six. yeah. I got time. It's just okay. I gotta get that process started. So mm. it's um yeah, dude. We're gonna get rid of the double doors and do a single door entry, mm. uh, room within a room kind of stuff. The the wow. entry wall is gonna get moved back mm. two feet, so we gain width in the theater. Um, there's just we're going to move the electronics rack back into the unfinished part of the basement so that it's not in the room with us. Okay. Um, and then, man, that's yeah, major there's, changes. There's, there's a lot of stuff. Dude, you got to so re run wires and everything. Yeah. Well, how I'm doing the room, since it's going to be a room within oh, a room, you, I'm going to be able that. to drop the wires behind the main, and then I'm going to be able to pull panels out and stuff to be able to get in behind stuff. So I'm not really concerned about that. And the reason I'm doing that is because, I'm I have screws loose, so I constantly want to change things and doing it this way allows me to change things all the time, change positions, add things, do a bunch of different stuff. So this is coming from the guy who five minutes ago said he just wants his theater to work. Now, yeah. he's, now he's changing things all over the place. I didn't say I wanted it to work now. I said I just wanted it to work. I just want it to be there. And work. <laughs> That'd be fun. Though, man. Uh, so I'm hoping it'll be done by M wave, but Sweet. if it's not, What'll end up happening is people can come over. We can talk. People can see it in progress. Like I'm mm -hmm. probably, if that's the case, in all honesty, if it's not done, I would probably refund people for that are, we're going to do that. And then um, it would just be open to certain people to be able to come over and see the room in progress mm -hmm. to see what is being done. You know, choices that were made things kind of because so most people we, don't get to see rooms in that state they see them in their finished state they never mm -hmm. get to see them in their you know showing everything under underneath the skirt state i may need to put a disclosure on yours maybe <laughs> i mean literally i mean literally yeah i mean there's i would potential. so, so write out something when you give me your updated photos i mean whatever. i can tell you what it's going to be but that's probably going to be yeah i mean it'd be black swans with either the p12 or p15 beryllium actives and a bunch of subs man and jvc with a i think a two to one screen is the direction i would think though even if your room isn't fully done you could still even like demo some of the like the Maybe. even a two channel black swan system or oh i could demo know. that stuff like i would set that up yeah um, i could put those in my living room or it might not be a whatever full no. but i think no. it's it would still be fair because the hard part I really think that these are going to sell out like they did last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they went stupid quick. Five hours VIP sold out. Um, what will probably happen is, is we'll do some like, I'm sorry, we'll do, hours, we'll hours. do something. So yeah. we'd probably do black Swan stuff. Cause they'll be here. And then I would probably do some level of comparisons and things. Yeah. Uh, am I do, Ooh, switching to Trinov? Not as of right now. You got booted from the week. Cap Club. <laughs> I didn't get booted from the Cap Club. <laughs> well, yeah, he'll still be in the Captivator Club. He just doesn't have the four thousand ULF. <laughs> He's going sealed. But I don't think they're Captivators, are they? Yes, JTR Captivator RS twos, RS ones. Are they? Yes, I didn't think the they cap. were. Oh my golly! Yes, one hundred percent. APR speakers. Are you sure? I promise you, dude. A thousand like percent. I'm I'm dead serious, dude. Hmm, let's see. Right here. Let me show it for everybody. Every once in a while, I like Okay, you're it. right. Shh. I know I'm right. I'm going to show right. everybody. You're like my wife. <laughs> here it is. Oh, right. we yeah. still got 36 yeah. questions. Yeah, Captivators. Boom. One, I told two, you two. it's going to be a long stream, Jonathan. Even, all right, so even the 2400 is a Captivator. See? Yeah, I'm still going to be part of the all Captivator all Club, evidently, Captivator, Mark. Don't worry. Man. So you Don't can worry. Be, Captivator is quite loose. How about that? All right, here we go. Um, rapid fire. He keeps said saying that. that. He, it keeps going back to these. I know, it's like five minutes. Rapid fire, five minutes of question. All right, Chris, appreciate this final super chat. For gamers, play Alan Wake 2. I heard good things about it. Totes a god tier. Totes a god tier home theater demo game with some intense Atmos with dedicated base option and also tone mapping. Good stuff, man. Yeah, you seen the requirements on that game too? That's crazy. 
gaming's come a long way, fellas. If you guys aren't playing games, even if you're a casual gamer like me, dude, there's some phenomenal games. And if you need some good recommendations, follow Jacob M. Stevens, I think. He's my son on TikTok. I saw, I saw a benchmark like. test on the Alan Wake 2, and I don't know if it's not optimized yet or not, but the 4090s without DLS 3.0 turned on, DLSS, yeah. was getting like uh, 22 yeah. frames per second or something at 4K. <laughs> that's a that's a $1,600 yeah. graphics card, the best on the market, and it can barely run the game. Yeah. And, well, you turn on DLSS 3.0, and it does real well. But. Yeah. Scott Lee, yes, the Ascendo Black Swans. Yeah. All right, here we go. Rapid fire. You keep saying you that, it. and I don't think you know what it means. <laughs> I do. Hey, I'm, I'm going with it. Uh, dual driver subs, some of them are push-pull per listen. Some of them have both drivers moving together, aren't all? Um, does the push-pull ones pressurize the room less because the drivers are out of phase? Interesting question. So he's talking about... What is listen. this? What? What is what happening? The emojis. Your computer's <laughs> loving you. It loves the smile, I'm, I promise, man. <laughs> I don't get it. You're smiling, you're laughing. Uh, you have, um, maybe they're excited for the 192 people that are hanging out I with guess. us tonight. And so, and maybe it was just saying, "Hey, if you're enjoying this live stream, you're enjoying the podcast, hit the little like button." Maybe. Let everybody. Some know. guy in chat's probably controlling, sending things to my stream. Oh, yeah. He's hijacked your computer. So yeah. back to this. Ada says, "Is the push pull? So one's going up, one's going in." Or the dual opposing, where they're both doing the same, does that change anything as far as the pressurization of a room? I don't technically know the answer to this, but I have some theories. There's okay. a thread on ABS forum that has the tactile base response thread or something like that. If you Google it, you'll find it. And there's so many guys in there that do this kind of testing, they'll be able to tell you. Mm -hmm. But but effectively, I can tell you this. They use these these accelerate accelerometer type things on your phone amp uh, on your phone app and uh, it vi measures vibration so what those guys have found in that kind of testing is that ported has the most vibration just from acoustic energy in the air for some reason and i don't know if it's distance for port or anything like that but just in general like for near field type stuff people say those ported subs have the most like the most vibration I also can tell you from all those subwoofer shootouts I was in where the seat and submersive was one of the contestants and that was a dual oppose. So they're firing like this. The drivers are not push pull or is it push pull? It would, they're, they're dual opposed. Right. So that's that not type of thing does not have very much vibration. In fact, one of the party tricks that Mark Seaton used to do, cause he used to come to those subwoofer meets himself. Mm -hmm. He would stand a dime on end, like where it was super thin standing oh. up. And it would stay on, and they would play that stuff, that sub at reference volume, and that dime wouldn't fall over. That cabinet, because the drivers are firing exactly opposite and they're perfectly placed, that sure. cabinet is inert. So it it's like the opposite. It doesn't have a whole lot of vibration in the room, comparatively speaking. I don't know what the other one would be, but that yeah. but that thread on AVS form would get you the answer if you ask those guys. Those guys are testing this kind of stuff all the time, and with and with apps, you know, to make sure they're doing it real real world stuff. I got nothing to add. Cool. All right, we'll keep moving. Uh, how good dual driver subs for near field base? So would you recommend two drivers or just a single nice size driver? My 4000 ULF sucks for near field. Mm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> It'd break my back. Do you, Did you ever test where the driver's like behind your head? I'm not trying to decapitate myself. Well, I mean, did you did you ever stand it up on end so it was vertical That's with cool. yours, or did you always have them laid down? No, they're just laid down. Yeah, that would be a concussion. Why would I do that? Well, I mean, that'd be about the right height, right? How tall is the how tall is the four thousand ULF? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it was a standard four thousand, but it's a sofa table, it's too wide. So there's a guy on the forums called Nate Dog who does that with his captivators he has them stand up behind his couch and that rear driver is kind of at his head level i've never felt that i have a suspicion i wouldn't like it no i, I mean mark it. tried or scott tried that with smaller subs and he said Actually, it he felt like it was getting assaulted well <laughs> geotech says scott's remember his are that way now they're vertical. i thought he took those down no, oh no. the four thousand yeah. yeah the picture they're they're vertical behind his seats 
my my opinion on this would be if you lie them horizontal like the traditional thing where they're firing to your back or your butt Mm -hmm. the, the trick with that would be you want that second driver and that first driver placed exactly behind your seat, mm -hmm. like centered, because if it's off to the side a little bit, if it's offset a little bit and the driver's firing right here, you'll feel it because that okay. acoustic energy coming off the driver cone is very tactile. You're going to mm -hmm. feel like, hey, my right side's vibrating and my left side isn't. You so can feel that with a single driver if it's not centered. Yes. So the problem is with the dual driver subs, unless you just happen to get lucky or buy furniture to match, how are you going to make those things be exactly centered to two seats? That's it doesn't, but I actually, it doesn't bother me at all when I sit on the side, there's so much energy, the ports over there. So there's so much energy coming out of that thing that it doesn't, I'm not oh. getting the same experience as the one in the middle, but it bothers me a whole lot. I can tell when it's off just a little bit, like on these things, they have to be exactly centered or I can oh. tell, especially With when that. I yes. I guess if I was sitting right next to the center seat, it would be a problem. But our couch, the seating positions are wide enough that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, that. That, I'm thinking a near field subwoofer might be cheaper than a lipotripsy. That's like the surgery that I had on my back for the um, kidney stones on my left yeah, side. Just crank, crank up the JTRs. It has to be really high frequency, though, I think, right? For that to work. I don't know, man. Yeah, actually, you're right. I did tell Scott Newby, I said, look, I said, if you can, if your subwoofer is at 150 dB, can can shatter my kidney stones, man. I'll I'll send you a check. I'll send you Venmo for three thousand dollars. It'll cost more than right that to have surgery. <laughs> All right, let's keep moving. Uh, Cody says, if I have various crossovers for different speakers and play music in multi-channel stereo, what will the receiver send to the sub? Oh, I, okay. So let's say, so let's hypothetically, you've got your front mains at say sixty hertz. You've got your center channel at 80 hertz, and he plays music in multi-channel. What will the receiver send to the sub? So each speaker is going to send that data information, whatever crossover you've set it. So if your mains are set at 60 hertz, everything 60 and below is going to get sent to the sub. For your center channel, any content that's playing, I think I said 80 hertz, so anything 80 hertz and below. So it just depends on what crossover is correct. That's correct. So right. and we've talked about that previous show, just in brief, if you have a real disparate crossover for your ceiling speakers, like if you have 120 Hertz and you use 60 Hertz on the front, if you run your bass hot, because there's more bass being routed to the subwoofer from your ceiling speakers, because that crossover is higher. If there's a single same sound object running around the room with a at, or like an Atmos object, you're going to notice that your subs come to life when that object goes through your ceiling speakers. That was a big problem for mine when I had disparate crossovers. I used to have some in-wall speakers up there. And anytime mm -hmm. like a helicopter sound would go to the ceiling, my subs would get that much louder because that redirected bass that was supposed to be going to the ceiling channels was going to the subs. Uh, and when I went to my main speakers at the time I had JTR and that was like 60 hertz crossover on those. When it sure. went there, there was less being redirected to the subs. So it's, mm -hmm. it, you have to be careful with those disparate crossover points. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. Flyers says, if I had two identical subs, would adding a third of the same model help with frequency response issues? Or do you really have to go four subs to get improvement? I think you can absolutely get in increased flatter frequency response with third, as long as you're dialing them in. You got to make sure they're time aligned. You may have to do some EQ. You may have to move, you know, placement of it. But I don't think you have to have four. The more subs you have, the flatter not even theoretically. I mean, they've kind of proven it. The more subwoofers you have throughout your room, the flatter you can get that. Thoughts on that, fellas? Yeah, you got it right. The one little caution that we would add, and we talked about it before on the podcast, is if you don't time align and you add a third, you might yeah. actually be worse yeah. off. 100%. Yep. Gotta I think that be. actually occurs in most people's rooms. They just mm -hmm. start adding subs and they're causing more problems than they're fixing. So again, unless you're measuring, you're just guessing. So I wouldn't recommend, if you're not willing to put in the time and effort to measure your subwoofers, to timeline them, to maybe get a mini DSP and learn how to use that. Or if you've got maybe a AVR or a processor that has like four independent outputs, that might work well as well. Um, but you got to put some time into it. Uh, Tyler says, is it necessary to put a high pass filter on a sealed DIY sub? Stair integrity HST 18 and a four cubic foot sealed box, or should I just let it rip and see how low it goes? 
I don't know, man. I'm, I'm like, no, you don't need an HPF on that. Sheldon has 16 of those things and he doesn't, he doesn't have, uh, HPF on it. In fact, I think he actually added an HPF, but not because it was going to blow up the sub. It was because it was making the house grown so much with 16 of those drivers and those low frequencies really vibrate things a lot. Sure. Kevin says, question, how much better is a budget processor than an AVR? Many thanks. Oh, great question. The age old. And I think it could even go to, is a, a processor better than an AVR? I think sometimes you may not hear a difference. I know I did a video a long time ago and it wasn't blind AB. We did the uh, Marantz SR8015, I think. It was either the 12 or the 15. And I think it was a, it was the 15 because we did that in preamp mode only. So the internal amplifiers were turned off. We were using my monolith 11 X amplifier. Then I swapped it out for the Marantz AV 7706. Of course you have to rerun calibration that takes some time. So it definitely was not an AB switch. There's some time, probably an hour in between those two. And I didn't think I was going to hear any difference. I really didn't. I thought, okay, this thing's in preamp mode. This one is a preamp, so it should be pretty equal. Me and my buddy, he didn't know what to expect. We both felt that we heard more distinct information, what I refer to as channel separation. I don't even know if that's really a, a term, but that's the way I describe it. I just heard more distinct, like I was noticing more precise sound, if that makes sense. Now, could that be placebo? Sure. Could Odyssey have calibrated one? different than the other absolutely so there's definitely some variables there um but i don't know what do you guys think how much better is a budget processor than an avr i don't know if he's gonna natively hear massive difference just because he goes to a processor i think asr has dispelled some of that snake oil in my opinion over the years with that because what used to be a real common refrain on the forums that if you needed to upgrade, you get a processor. And ASR has gone back and measured a bunch of those. This is audio science review yeah. uh, on the test bench and proven out that a lot of times the companies that have both processors mm -hmm. and ABRs, they'll measure mm -hmm. the same. Like the signal to noise ratio is the same. The performance is the same. They're using a lot of times the same DSP chipsets. Or even if they're not, they might be above the audible level of the human. So... Mm -hmm. I, I tend to fall, and then the testing I've done over the years, which was multiple amp tests and even some ABR comparisons, one in 2014 that was a really advanced one with like eight different flagship processors. Mm -hmm. I tend to think the auto EQ is what makes those differences. So if you run Odyssey or whatever other one you're using, uh, any of the different flavors from the different manufacturers, YPAO, Mac, all those different things, yeah. they have their own flavor and even runs between the mm -hmm. same unit like back-to-back -back units will have variations mm -hmm. so if you have that stuff on it's real hard to it's real hard to know what you're actually getting because we were measuring the frequency response on each of those things so we know what we were getting mm -hmm. and and those things were not the same but if you turn off the auto eq they're the same so so it, it adds so much variability with those auto eqs sure it's and hard. that could have been what we experienced when we ran odyssey on the processor let's say maybe it did a better job you know than the previous one so Good question there, Kevin. Alan Billings says, Michael, my Denon 6700H only working on eco mode on. My first question is, can I bypass this if I use external amps? My recommendation is not to use eco mode. Um, I think I he's saying it only works with eco mode on. Why though? I guess. I don't know. So I had that receiver before my AV10 now, and eco mode is actually just like, if you engage it, it will step out of eco mode when you go above negative 32 on the volume. So 31, 30, 29, 28. Like it's, it's not, it doesn't just. Like, so, like throttle the. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you have it on auto mode, maybe I'm, maybe I'm misspeaking. If you have it on auto mode, it will come in and out of eco mode on its own. Once you pass, I think it's the 32, okay, if I remember right, DB threshold. Mm -hmm. Why is it only working in eco mode? That'd send that back. It should even still be under warranty. I think at this mm -hmm. point. That's not good. Don't, yeah. But if you bypass it and use the pre-outs, the external amps, I don't, the you internal amps don't turn off. Right. The, and the the pre the pre uh, outputs will always be hot. Like yeah. whether you have it in pre-out mode or not, the pre-out mode just ups the voltage that's coming out of the pre-out modes. So yes. eco you mode should be able to bypass no matter what, if it's on eco or not, I think. 
Yeah, because the eco should only affect the internal amplification. Mm-hmm. And that might be a good question, honestly. I mean, we're kind of hypothetically guessing. Maybe reach out to Denon first. If it only works with eco, eco mode on, I definitely would reach out to them and see if that's still under manufacturer warranty. Uh, let's see. Drop Tone says, I know you have Mad VR at the shows, but have you had or planned to have Lumigen? Great question. Um, I had one conversation with Lumigen at Cedia. They um, asked if they could speak with me. So I, they caught me in between. I was uh, filming. I was about to go to my next one. I said, hey, I've got a few minutes. Sure, let's talk. Um, but honestly, I haven't heard back from them. So after that, they had a, uh, a home theater. They wanted me to tour somewhere out of state. So uh, that has the Lumigen in it. What's that? I, did, I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead and finish your thought. Good. That was it. I was just going to say on that previous comment, it occurred to me that I was using that with a, as a pre-pro and I had the auto set, which like I mentioned, goes to eco automatically. So I know for sure that the eco mode works with mm-hmm. pre-pro pre-out amps, but the, the RCA pre-8s will work in eco mode is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm totally open to Lumigen being there, so, but we don't have a Lumigen. So, I think that'd be cool to see because there's a lot of talk on the forums on that, and there haven't I haven't seen any comparisons of that Illumigen and Mad VR. There's been some. I think Manny and some other guys have done them. I'm they've they sure. haven't been uh, like public, but they've posted pictures and stuff of them. Hmm. I did see. I don't remember his name, but a while back I saw somebody. They were showing like some side by sides. Mm-hmm. So. But it's been a long time since I've seen that. But it was a long thread, too. I think somebody linked it in either in my... I bet it was a Facebook group. Because you can't link on my my YouTube channel. Uh, Dev says, which is the best starter home theater kit for an 11 by 14 room? Interested in installing a Dolby Atmos as well. So good starter home theater, maybe budget home theater. That's subjective. Yeah. But, I mean, we can still point them in the direction. I mean, uh, if you're super, super budget conscious, look at um, Monolith. Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner has reviewed some of their stuff. They measure pretty decent. I like the Martin Logan, the new series. Uh, I don't know if that's Starter. Again, the Foundation you know, start- series is. Everybody's Starter is probably different. Um my my biggest recommendation dev if you can just try to listen to try to find some home theaters get involved in home theater groups look on avs forums if there's any group meetups in your area even be willing to travel to to hear stuff because once you hear it then you can know is that the sound that you're looking for um any other thoughts on that maybe some budget friendly brands I think we already kind of mentioned a little bit on the show, but SVS and HSU have full system options and they're, I'd say mid tier products for the most part. And I think they're probably good enough that a lot of people won't. I mean, if you just think of America as a whole, a lot of people would never need to upgrade from that type of product. Like you're, you're at a pretty good place when you're in those, in that realm. Does shoe have um, speakers as well? They do. Awesome. Cool. All right, let's keep going. JR, question, is it okay to run Ethernet cables, speaker wires, and HDMI kit together, or do they cross interference? So I don't, I've never had an issue of doing that. You just don't want to run them through power or cross power if you can help it. Right, those should be okay. If you, you they HDMI carries a trace power. Ethernet can carry power over Ethernet, but I, I too have not had problem with those. So try and see. Alan Billings, uh, also, do you think one of the new Sony receivers, I think he's asking, am I getting one in for you? I haven't, I don't have any con, well, I do have contacts for Sony. Um, I'd love to hear your take on spatial audio and how it compares to Odyssey and Direct. I think we need to get one at M-Wave. See if we can get one, do some comparisons. That'd be fun. I don't have one. Honestly, I'm trying to get caught up. I am so far behind, but I'm I'm closer. I'm getting there. I'm just cranking them out, man. I've been doing two, three, four videos a week. Uh, Bill Hayes would love to know more about the Arvolution NAS. 
uh, I believe the NAS will be available outside the US, correct? Can you play direct from the unit or does it need a separate player? Yeah, so you will need uh, our Volution player. The NAS literally is just storage and the ability to rip music from a Blu-ray disc to that NAS. So you still have to have a player. Sassikant, uh, what would be the closest DIY driver amp combo to a JTR RS1? What do mm. you think, Jonathan? Maybe some so, uh, as we mentioned, that JTR driver is a pretty expensive driver. You're a lot of times you're probably going to want a couple of a cheaper budget driver to match one of those as far as output realistically, because you get three dB by doubling drivers. Um, and that's about the range that an 18 inch driver of a highest quality would have versus a like, kind of an entry level about three dB range there. So I, you know, I think you can go a long, you can go a long way with something like these UM 1822s that I have here as a sealed driver. Um, you put a nice bit of power to them, same as the speaker power amp or something. I, I really don't think you'd be able to tell much difference at, at below their highest limits of output. And I say that also with another test in my back pocket. The LMS 5400 is arguably the best 18-inch driver that ever came out. It was a $1,000 driver 20 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, made by TC Sounds. Like a 90-pound driver, huge magnet structure, better than a JTR driver. Its magnet structure is about this thick. Uh, aluminum cone, just top of the line. A buddy bought two of those drivers and brought them over here, and he out bought the same cabinets I did from the cam same shop. So we had the same cabinets, same amp. We had a Crown XLS 5000. I had a UM18 versus his LMS 5400. We listened to a bunch of different stuff. We A, beat them side by side in my room, and at the end of the night, my buddy's like, why did I spend four times the amount of driver on the driver? The only mm -hmm. time that we could tell the difference, either one of us, is when we went to that last couple dB of output. He had a couple dB more than I did, uh, you know, as we went to the absolute limits before we started hearing distortion. And that, that was the only place we could hear the difference. So, so I kind of rewind to that thing. Like, you don't have to spend as much to, to do it if you don't, if you can go with a couple dB less, you can save a lot of money, just truly. Um, speaker power makes about the best amp in the business, probably, as far as like subwoofer amps. And so that's really expensive. What's a speaker power amp cost, Ryan? Like a couple thousand bucks for Not cheap. like a 2400 watt amp or something? Mm -hmm. You know, that's built into a JTR. So if you, if you had matching amplifiers, matching boxes, the driver is going to give you a couple dB variance if you get a competent driver. You, and there's like, if you go to GS, uh, GCS, what am I saying here? GSG audio design. If you web search that GSGAD.com, they have a bunch of subwoofer drivers. You can kind of look at some options there and they even like rate what they're best used for and they have nice prices and so forth. So you can get some ideas there. The do it yourself forums on ABS form has so much information on this kind of stuff. You can, you can, really put something together that for a, save a lot of money if you have a little bit of inkling to do so sure roy co says will m wave have a seminar or room where they can demonstrate how to measure and tune your room sorry for the new question absolutely no worries on the sorry it's a great question i would love to have more seminars how to even basic how to take your first measurement with rew um you know the benefits of adding two subwoofers or three subwoofers so you can physically see what happens when they're dialed in how can it fix these room modes in the room so it's just a matter of finding who's going to lead those uh, sometimes we can get a brand maybe that would say hey i'd love to be able to share that with your audience um, but yeah i would love to add a lot more um, how-to kind of stuff and really really beneficial seminars so as far as will we definitely have that, I can't promise that, but it's definitely on my uh, desire list. So if we can get somebody to lead it. Bill Haynes, will the LS12000 be great throw, great throw at shorter, help me out here, guys. What's he asking? I think he's asking, can you use a shorter distance, a shorter throw distance than the JVC? This is the question. This question okay. I think came up from Scott's. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Uh, big street cinema. If I have three towers in the front, I get one more and one amplifier channel over. Is it possible to make a center channel left and center channel right in any way, like in a storm or a trend off? So he's asking, can I use multiple center channels? 
You can. I don't, I don't think you would want to put it to the left and right of your TV. If anything, you'd do maybe top and bottom, correct? If your processor can handle that and do whatever magic it's trying to do. Because typically, if you take two of the same identical signal and you split those and separate them, that oftentimes isn't a good combination. Well, he's um, not. Well, yes. There's <laughs> been some rooms that have done this very successfully. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Typically, it's not a good idea, but there are some companies that are figuring that out and they're doing some DSP that allows that to be. You wouldn't you know, want to split the signal. You would need to, each speaker would need to have its own time delays in EQ. Really it's possible. Your your storm or trend off, it doesn't have that capability built in, right? It wouldn't no. have that option. I think that's probably the reason. No, you would have to do it manually. I don't think you would want to put that to the left and right of your center channel or to your, like say for instance, you got a 80 inch TV. You wouldn't put a, a center. Well, channel. I don't think he's that. necessarily talking about a TV. All right. Let's just say you got a hundred inch, whatever ultra short throw TV projector. I don't think it would be ideal to do a left center and a right center. Does that make sense? Cause now you're getting your center channels really close to your mains. You're not going to have yeah. any separation there. That's why I'm know. saying instead of doing it this way, if anything, I would do a top and a bottom, but very few systems can even accommodate that. I mean, if he's just asking, can he just because he has the extra stuff? I wouldn't. I would not. Yep. So Rohit says, are the clip center channels as good as the SVS? My answer is no. Um, I reviewed the SVS ultra and at the time i had that was way before aaron made a video on center channels and i still to this day remember going and this is one of the best center channels i've heard what i didn't realize i think it's a three-way center channel the biggest difference is they have the woofers on the left and right and then in the center they have a tweeter and a mid-range vertically and if you go watch aaron's video he has one called why most center channels suck and in that video, he'll tell you why, and Jonathan mentioned this earlier, most MTM center channels don't sound as good as a vertical center channel or a or like a vertical speaker or a speaker that has two woofers on the side, but maybe two vertical speakers in the middle of those woofers. So to me, the SVS center channel is a better center channel. However, I like the RF7 version 3s better than I like the uh, SVS Ultra Towers. So for what that's worth. But ideally, three identical speakers. That'd be great versus a horizontal ch center channel, but not everybody can do that. Any thoughts, fellas? Nope. Okay, moving on. I told you I can lighten around this thing. Adam, hello from <laughs> uh, Vernon, Canada. What's up, brother? Looking to pick up an LS12000, great projector. What do you guys recommend for a solid motorized screen around 120, 100 to 120? Appreciate anyone's input. I don't have any experience with motorized screens. The only two companies that I would consider in this regard are going to be Seymour and Stewart. I've had too many issues with other companies doing motorized screens for customers. Okay. Those are the only two I would do. And if you want to do something, let me know. Can There's a lot that we need to consider with those, like screen material. Camera? Yeah. Okay. I'll throw this up there real quick. All right. Hit him up. MidwestAVExperience.com slash sales. All right. Hardeep says, question. I have a Denon 8500 Oppo 205. How beneficial is it to use the Denon app, which you already purchased, to pull back the calibration curtain? Okay, cool on the top end for improved audio many things my recommendation is always try it both ways if you've already bought the app you already have the ability you can create one with a curtain and you can save that to i think the 80 oh man i don't remember does the 8500 have the ability to have the two presets do y'all know no i don't think so i think it's That's one generation too soon one. So that would have been a really great on some of the newer models because then you can literally do one with a curtain, 
save it as preset one, do without. Um, but it still doesn't take that long. You could listen to some content, see what you think, go into the AVR. You can duplicate, I'm sorry, go into the app. You can duplicate that um, preset, let's call it, saved calibration, and then change the curtain, what you're talking about, let it do full range on one, and then add a curtain on the other, and then just listen. Um, so thoughts on that? Yeah, you look up Schroeder frequency on the web, S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R. That's a, a frequency that kind of in your room minimizes any EQ to frequencies that would be ab above where the bounder gains would interact. So you're basically only going to be trying to EQ frequencies on the lower end of the frequency spectrum. So a lot of rooms will have like 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz type range where their Schroeder frequency falls, maybe even as high as 500 hertz. Mm -hmm. And you would stop EQing everything above that because anything you EQ to that kind of can, can not be a real EQ that is desirable. You can EQ lower because those might be actual like uh, room interactions that, that will be beneficial. So if you do that, you'll kind of, you can calculate your Schroeder frequency of your room and then you can curtain it with the Odyssey app at that frequency. Mm -hmm. That'll give you plenty of information to to read through and digest. Ardeep says, I feel sometimes when we term a sub a good sub, the nodes in the room and acoustic characteristics make a huge difference. The greatest sub will potentially perform poorly if misplaced. 100% yep. agree with you. Tito says, since you guys are surrounded by great subs all the time, what makes JTR always come to the top? We, we talked about that one already. Clear. Kevin, guys, is there any sense in saving up for a new Emotiva MC1 processor to replace an older Onkyo Ab Atmos AVR? Thanks. No. You could stop at Emotiva, in my opinion. Though. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, man. I know people, they, they always tell me in the chat, Michael, you really need to try out this new one that they got. I get it. You know, Guys, Emotiva makes... For the money, decent amps. I, love them. I, love I think them, they make supposedly. I've never heard their speakers. Supposedly they make decent speakers. They're okay. They're not an AVR pre pro company. They are. I mean, they are, but <laughs> they shouldn't be. Technically, they are. But they shouldn't be. <laughs> there it is. Just a short version, Kevin. I mean, I I haven't had great experience with their processors. I've owned one way back in the day, and I reviewed one. The one I reviewed was a six thousand dollar processor it should have been amazing and it had a lot of bugs a lot of issues i like their amps yeah, i think they I'm do a good job with their amps, but. here's what you need to do go to the emotiva forum and read there and you'll see nothing but positive they own the forum they delete anything that's negative go to abs forum and read the threads there on emotiva a little bit different you'll see the real story yeah and i i just remember i, I emailed them i said hey look I just want to let you know, like, here's the issue. And I have, I was very upfront with them. I said, Hey, I'm having this issue. And then I worked with their engineer or they'd email me, try this, try this. And so the, I was very transparent. Here's what I'm running into. There weren't any surprises and I'm getting ready to film and I'm going, man, is this even going to be worth making a video? Cause this thing has just been frustrating. And so I sent them a list. I said, Hey, here's what I like. Here's the issue I've had. And they were quite extensive. And I said, any thoughts? And the response I got was, I think, it, I think the response was sounds fair. Like they knew it had issues. So they were like, go for it. And so I made the video and, and people still bought it because they still said, Hey, I like what it does. Well, I can deal with the issues. Hopefully they'll fix these with firmware updates. And maybe they have by now, hopefully my goodness, it's been a couple of years, but just in the past, especially a new one, they just really haven't come out of the gate going, mm -hmm. man, these are amazing and perform really well. It usually takes quite a while. And unfortunately, a lot of times just past record, they'll something will come out and then they'll be like, oh, we'll fix this and fix this and fix this. But it just it just takes a long time. So and it's not only the bugs, it's a lot of I mean, just being honest here, it's false promises too. like we promise you this, 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 and it never comes to fruition over the course of these receivers. And they say, we'll fix it in the next one. We can't fix it with this one. We'll fix it in the next one. Well, then they get burnt again. I mean, I, I was going to bring that up, but didn't want to be that guy. I, I mean, it's just real. Like, let's be honest. Just, here. That's, that's been going on for decades. Yeah. It's sad. I, want, I want them to make a great product. I mean, there's no brand out there. I think that any one of us 
on this podcast go, you know what? I'm glad they failed on that. No, we want them to succeed because if it's a great product, then that means more options for you. Yeah, it means more options for you as a consumer, more options for us. And then the competition helps drive down the prices, causes the other competition to make a better product. So it's a win-win for everybody. So we don't want anybody to fail, but the reality, they just haven't proven themselves. Pedro says, yeah, I've got his up there. Pedro says, knowing that some subs have more mid-base than others, for example, shoe versus a JTR. Uh, what happens if you make the exact frequency response from 100 to 20, 100 hertz to 20,000 hertz? Will you feel different in a small room? Yes, and here's why. Frankly, it's not even really fair to say that there's more mid bass on one or other if you EQ it the same, because they there won't be. But once you go past the limitation of the uh, driver, your say you say you turn your sub to maximum output. Your native frequency response, you might have EQ'd it flat as a pancake. Your native frequency response starts emerging again. Mm -hmm. If there's like a, a hump at, say, 60 hertz on the sub, it's native frequency response before they did the EQ that's built into the amp. As you start pushing that thing to max, mm -hmm. you're bringing that 60 hertz back. So that mid bass is because it's going back to its natural, like the the inductance of the driver, like the the tune of the driver. All those things have a natural frequency response. Where if they're out of the box and so forth, this is the this is what the frequency looks like. You're starting to witness that is what's happening there. You're hitting its limits. If you kept it low volume at the with the flat frequency response, that's when you're not going to tell a difference. So that kind of comes back to that previous conversation we had too. Mm -hmm. Hardeep, uh, here's a question I had. Oh, we did that one. He must have posted it twice. Josh, PB2000 versus RSL12s. I haven't had any from. I haven't had any experience with the RSL subwoofers. So probably the best thing is, I mean, sadly, I mean, wish we had the database. I don't think either of those were on there. No. Uh, I'm looking. Hold on. While you're doing that, I'll keep going. We'll come back to it. Uh, OSU Fanatic says, thoughts on the passive Ascendo speakers, anyone? Not subs? Ryan likes them. I do. They're good. Uh, all right. I'm in a position where we can talk about the okay. I'm comparison back. there. Let me get this other page up. So does he have measurements on this? He does. All right, so this is raw measurements. I pulled these off AudioHolix. Um, just looking at the comparisons between these two. So the RSL Speedwoofer. Here, I'll send these to you on the chat. Yeah, so that you can put them up. Okay. Copy. I'm gonna go back to all right. So this one, that one. So we'll start with the RS12. Unless you can put them side by side. Okay, let's put it on the stream yard. Did you pull them up? Like, I mean, I dropped them in the chat. I mean, I won't. Oh, to... oh I see what you're saying. Oh, my bad. I thought you were wanting me to just put them on screen. The oh. What's funny is you have the ability to do that dingling. You're better at it, and I'm lazy. <laughs> I see that. All right, here we mm -hmm. go. All right, share screen. Boom, RSL. Okay, that's the first one I got up. Okay, so the RSL, if we look at the measurements here, at 12.5 hertz, 87.7, limited by a third harmonic, um, with yeah. about 18% distortion. The oh, 16 okay. is what we're paying attention to mostly, is 100, 20s, 100. Four and a half, 105, 25s, 106.5. Now mm -hmm. let's look at the SVS. Okay. So then let's go. So I'll remove that. Add SVS. Okay. Sure. And the SVS, man, that got small, is going to be. 93.8 at 16 where the rsl was 
100. And at 20, they're just about even. 25, the mm -hmm. SVS is better. Mm -hmm. So pretty so, similar. Well, the low end extension on the RSL is much better. It's about a it's a seven dB difference. Yeah, so hundred versus, not, oh yeah, ninety three. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. But in the higher frequencies, the so 50 SBS hertz, is better. One thirteen compared to one oh nine. SVS leading. Yep. I mean, the port's gonna. It just has more output. It's probably has a bigger cabinet. So if you want the low end excursion extension, go with the RSL. If you want more output up top, go with the SVS. Okay. Would you recommend a six and a half inch two way bookshelf over a horizontal MTM center channel? I guess if you could, sure. What do you think, Jonathan? Depends on the dispersion characteristics of the bookshelf. Uh, I'm not a big fan of six and a half inch bookshelves in general because I don't think they have enough volume to hit. I don't have enough driver to hit reference volume. Six and a half driver typically won't do it. You need eight. Um, that's my persuasion. So if you had an eight inch bookshelf, maybe I'd be more interested to hear. But but if your MTM is also like using four inch drivers or something, it's a moot point. Um, but a single six and a half won't hit reference usually. That's That's what I would say if you care about that. Hardy, as we are now talking about center channel performance, may I ask, I think it's this right here. Um, we already did that one. Perfect. Yep. David, I'm looking at purchasing a new home theater preamp, the Acris Muse, and wonder if you've heard anything about their amps, 2005 and 2007, which is 200 by 5, 200 by 7, while I have Krell S275 amps, 275 by 2. Yeah, I don't think you're going to hear any difference between, say, a Krell and a and an Acura amplifier. Definitely how much is that Acura? I don't know what they're. The Muse. Are. How much is the Muse? The Muse. Acura. Man. SRP. Ten thousand euros. A so fifty-five hundred MSRP. Really? For the Muse? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that was in an AVS forum back in twenty twenty-two. Yeah, it says Muse 16 channel SSP with uh, 5,500 MSRP, what they were saying. Hmm. I thought it was more than that. Uh, okay, yeah. so Stereo Net is showing 14,000 AUD. So I don't know what that'd be, US. Does anybody know how much it is? Yeah, they're so saying 5 Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what the southern one says here. Audioholics did a um, summary of it. I don't think it was an actual review, but just a summary. Uh, I would go think? class D amplification. Is the direction I would go. Dave says, why does the JVC cult always get really upset when a guy who owns both the Epson and JVC says he likes the Epson better? I don't think that's Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know the answer to that. I try to figure that out myself. I, I think, think people is, I think go ahead. I think on AVS forum there really is a JVC cult. And I think mm -hmm. that they almost almost to the point where I think there's shills on the forum. I can't mm -hmm. prove it. Wow. But there's just there, there's there's almost like venom if mm -hmm. you say Absolutely. anything about negative about JVC and the, and they'll come into the Epson threads or anything like that and just like yeah. basically you know attack. Mm -hmm. Epson people don't go into JVC threads and do that. So it's it is weird. I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. I'm I think it's because that. if you poo poo on any but anything that somebody has, they get butt hurt because they've spent money on it. Well, the JVC guys have no problems poo pooing on the Epson side. That's the part that doesn't make sense. Like it's a, it's like a. I don't know. JVC cold is the right word. Yeah. And I think okay. You, I, well, oh. here's the truth. 
So you can have a cult in any following the, or any brand. Absolutely, you can. You know, and it depends on where you like. I was a Klipsch guy for a long time. Still enjoy Klipsch, but I never really considered myself like. To me, the cult mentality is this is the only way kind of deal versus like if you want to buy an Epson, Epson makes a great projector. Um, they've got some great models that they produce. The 5040, I had that for a while. I love that projector. The 6050 is a great projector. The LS12000, great projector. Depends on what your needs are, what your budget is, what you're looking at. Jonathan showed some videos or a video on his channel just recently. Epson has better motion handling. Okay. That's a given. I mean, you can sit there and put them side by side and go, okay, this one kind of has a little jittery going on over here. This one's smooth. All right. But on the flip side, you can go, okay, this one over here has some really good blacks. This one isn't that great in blacks. So part of it depends on what is like, what do you need? What is important to you? But I don't care what you buy. You know, if you want to buy um, JVC, if you want to buy a BenQ, if you want to buy a Barco, Christie, I don't care. As long as and I don't know. think I don't think Jonathan is necessarily saying that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, but I don't think you were ever saying that the Epson is better than all JVCs. I think you were directly comparison comparing against the NZ7. Yeah. The NZ7 does have shortcomings when it comes it comes to anti contrast. I mean, that's where it is. But when you get to the high contrast optical block of the nz8 and nz9 you're paying more for that mm -hmm. and it starts to fix that problem but you're directly comparing comparing it to the nz7 i think people just get butthurt about it yeah before you go to the next one i want to rewind a second on this oh, I have, good. i'm glad you said that i have a couple charts and i and not about this not about the epson thing i've i've been it on that enough let's go okay. to share okay. screen go ahead and I'm going to do my entire screen here. So let me know when you can see it. Right and I want to rewind the conversation to when we were talking about subwoofer uh, returning to like their original native EQ or their, their basically native EQ as you push them to their limits. So I'm going to okay. show you just, I just grabbed a couple. It didn't really matter, but just to show you. So one of the questions was, this driver is known as being a mid-bass subwoofer, and this one's known as being a low subwoofer. And what I want to kind of show you is here, uh, this is like, I just grabbed one. This is an Arendelle subwoofer. Okay. As you start doing compression sweeps, this person is just turning this up. And every time he turns it up, you can see that this thing goes up like 5 dB. Mm -hmm. When it starts running out of headroom, either to the driver or to the amp or to the box or anything else, then you see that this compression starts occurring and it's no longer going up in unison, right? Mm-hmm. Well, look where this peak is. This peak here is about 60 hertz. So as you turn this up to 110, 115 dB level, mm -hmm. you basically have hardly anything down here, down low. You're, you're, it's almost like your frequency starts at 50 or 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So someone might hear this and be like, I turned it up. I heard a lot of mid bass. That had strong mid bass. It's uh, not so much that had strong mid bass. It's that the other stuff all got shaved off, off right? Mm -hmm. okay. So now let's go to look at an SVS. This is an SVS PV16. You can see the same thing happens here. We're going up five, 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 and we're starting to cut out. The driver is starting to cut out up here on the compression sweep. So it's, and, and these are just, I didn't like try to pick something that was really low. You can find ones that are really low or really high. This is just a couple like kind of mainstream subs, right? This one is centered at like 30 to 40 hertz as its peak when it starts running out of headroom. There's a big difference between the tone at 30 hertz and 60 hertz. It's a totally different sound, especially in movies. Like uh, uh, if you go to a commercial movie theater, a lot of them don't even go lower than 30 hertz. So at this one's max output, 115 dB, 120 dB in that area, you're hearing the 30 hertz movie theater low volume stuff, the almost not quite, but pant leg shuffling stuff. Mm -hmm. And on the Arendelle at its max output, you're hearing more of the 60 to 70 hertz, like chest kick cavity stuff. So what I'm what I'm trying to kind of illustrate here is that if they were if they were both being played down here nice and flat within the limits of the subwoofer, mm -hmm. they're gonna sound pretty much the same because they're both nice and flat. But when you get up to the limits, they behave differently. At mm -hmm. their limits, the subwoofers return basically to what they do without EQ. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I wanted to show, kind of explain it a little bit more clearly, because I didn't know if the verbal explanation was enough. No, that's good stuff. That's why we keep Jonathan around. 
Uh, Michael says, I would, or wouldn't it be fun to create a community movie night? Jonathan actually does that in his community. He even does them outside sometimes, man. Everyone across the world watching the same movie, all community driven. That'd be interesting. Paul says, I think I that would two. be cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. Like if all of us watch the same movie during a week before the next show. No, he's talking about like at the same time though. I well, yeah, Community. but I'm trying. That's not really going to be possible. But well, I'm thinking about having taking this to like a book club, mm. right? If we oh, had yeah. something where we started every show with yeah. a movie mm -hmm. that we watched, have two PB uh, three thousands port ports plugged, and so basically he's running it sealed. And two SB 3000s. Okay, so technically he's got four sealed subwoofers. So he's using two as near fields. If I get two JTR RS1s, can I keep the SVS subs in the system? 100%. I mean, they're going. How to does the ported sub behave if you plug it in comparison to a truly port sealed sub? Yeah, what does it I do mean, to the phasing? It's not really a phase problem, but a lot of times the box on a ported sub is intentionally large because you need that for the ported volume. And if you have a sealed sub, the box is smaller because the air helps dampen the driver and keep the driver in control. A lot of times a sealed driver isn't as strong of a motor. So it is a little bit of a compromise if you have like one that can do the different tunings. It might not be its best sealed performance in that size box, but it doesn't have the problems with like the, the group delay, the ported box, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it, it basically a multiple of the port tuned frequency, you get a little bit of a kind of a notch in the higher frequencies. Maybe it's four times. I can't remember the number, but it won't have that exhibition. So, so really, if you get two JTR sealed subs and you have two sealed box SVS, you can probably use them. Just know that your SVS might become a limiting factor. So put the SVS closer to your listening position. That'd be the one caution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Inside the, the, app so you can actually tell it now i don't know what it does dsp wise but there are settings so you need to tell it hey i'm using this in sealed mode so it'll adjust that like dsp for sealed so make sure you do that that's another nice thing huh? i didn't know they had that well mm -hmm. i mean on the phone app i guess it makes sense because those those amps would have that yeah that's cool yeah so they they kind of cater that dsp for that um and it even goes to the extent of let's say for instance you have instead of because let's say on the pb 16s there's three ports so mm -hmm. you could plug i forget what it is maybe the you plug two of them and it gives you one tuning frequency but mm -hmm. in the app you tell it i use two ports mm -hmm. so but i'm probably changing the hpf among other things high pass filter mm -hmm. yep uh hardeep says guys please help me I have, we've already I done that one how many times did you ask bro do us a favor, fellas. I promise you, we're doing our best to star a lot of these questions. So just asking it over and over, all it does is do what we did here. A Vivid Theater Storm Audio's 20 channel ISR Fusion 20 upgradable. Also, does the built in amps have enough power for power hungry speakers? The Fine. HDMI card is upgradable, but the chassis is not. But it's it runs 200 watt amplifiers per channel. It's a it's a hoss. What about if the, you're can okay. go ahead. I was gonna say, what about their? Oh, he's asking about built-in amps. So, plenty. So of no, there. it's not upgrade. You can upgrade the HDMI card, but you're not gonna mm -hmm. be able to upgrade the actual chassis. Mm -hmm. it, but if it's something you're considering, I mean, it's it's like having a pre-pro with everything built into one box. I mean, it's mm -hmm. 200 watts per channel for all channels. It's a hoss. And I do sell them. And part of that part of that selling is I come out with the price of it, and we calibrate it on site. If that's at all interesting or in, of interest to you, uh, a couple more questions, Christopher Day. When I try to use Arc, I tell Ryan keeps starring them. Uh, when I try to use Arc on the Anthem eleven forty, it tells me that my subs are too loud and won't let me continue. It only work if I turn them down. To we, you can barely hear them. So this is probably because the subs are outside the threshold that ARC is going to be able to compensate for. A lot of um, room correction will only correct to a certain number of decibels. A lot yeah. of cases, it's 12 above and 12 below. 
Yeah. And depending on how you do that, sometimes it's even less than that. So you have to have all of your speakers gain settings, including your subwoofers within mm -hmm. that threshold. And if it's not within that threshold, evidently arc will stop. Um, things like Dirac just won't do it. Odyssey won't bring it down to that level. It'll just bring it down to the extent that it can, and then it'll stop. So you'll still have a peak. So you need to try and if possible, um, match as well as you can that's what your problem is and then if you're turning them down and not level matching that may be why they're they're coming in too neutered or it could be that your room curve is flat and you want to have a elevated base cool last couple questions and we're still at 189 of you guys hanging out with us we appreciate you hit the thumbs up let us know if you're enjoying the uh podcast here if it's educational, if it's helpful, if it's beneficial, it's one way of just tangibly letting YouTube know and maybe it'll get out to more people. M. Sullivan, who makes the best 5.2 or 7.2 channel AVR for both surround and stereo? A lot of people like Anthem. But for 5.2 and 7.2? Mm -hmm. Anthem's going to be above that, aren't they? For channel oh, count? I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd say Denon. Think so? I just don't hear a lot of people saying, "Yeah, man, I love my." I don't know. Some people but are real. To me, when I see five point two and seven point two, it just it seems like a budget in these circles. So I'm trying to he stick to a budget. A bunch of speakers, though, either. He's just looking for a great sound for home theater and music. Some people I, are saying Rotel Anthem. I mean, I'm Best. still going to say. I'm still going to say, it, I won't say it's the best, but mm -hmm. for the money, I'm still saying Denon and Morantz. Huh? Using yeah. like the the multi-EQX app and stuff. I mean, you have tremendous control over what you're doing as long as you know how to EQ in your way around it. I mean, yeah. Jonathan's system doesn't suck. <laughs> I know Thanks. for a long, yeah, you're right. That's true. I know a long your time. Your system ago. doesn't suck. People would always say, "Oh, you know, the Marantz has the uh, the M music chip." Yeah, yeah. That's what they used to always say, and it's like that's all subjective. Nobody's really comparing that, like A B comparison. They're just saying, you know, I swap. We it did out. it M Wave. Did you hear? You remember hearing that story? Mm -mm. Oh, I wish Bob was here to tell it because he told it at the last little get together. It's real funny to hear. I was in the audience. And the new Marantz is let you, the 2022 lets you change that on yes. and off. Yes. And so at one point I said, Hey, can you just toggle that on and off and let us see if we can hear it? So we got a group of eight guys, right. whatever, listening in there. And so he's got some music playing. I don't even know what it was, just some audio file music. And he's mm -hmm. flipping that on and off. And, and he said, all right, raise your hand when I switch it. And he was doing it through the, the web interface. So you couldn't see on the right. screen or anything when he was doing it. I Nobody raised that. their hand for like a minute. And then, we started like kind of raising our hand. The first guy's hand went up and then that kind of gave the rest of us some confidence. Like, I, I think, I, I think I heard something. So we raised our hand. So then the hand started going up and down more regularly. Bob stopped it. And he's just like, you guys are idiots. He said, the first minute was when I was switching it. The second minute, when you guys started raising your hand, somebody had come up and started talking to me and I had stopped switching it because I was talking to them and I wasn't even paying attention. So I didn't ever switch it one time when you guys were raising your hands. Yeah. So that tells you how much that matters. Oh, oh that's, guys. That's that confirmation bias. We see uh, somebody else and we're like, oh, I, yeah. I should be hearing that. Maybe mm -hmm. I do. And your brain tells you things. So, Guys, our ears are not machines. There's my right here. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Our ears are not machines. You're not going to be able to tell. Don't go. I, I really appreciate what Audio Science Review does, but you don't need to buy the best. I did that at one point. I've got a um, X Saber Pro sitting right okay. next to me, and it's a phenomenal DAC. But if I put that next to like my Blue Sound, I can't tell the difference. Yeah. If I put that next to my Storm, I can't, can't tell. If I put it next to my Marantz 5.2 upstairs, I can't tell yeah. because our, our ears are not machines. They actually kind of suck at being able to differentiate between these types of frequencies. They're really good at some things. They're not really good at finding out those minute things. So yeah. I really want to encourage people to buy what's necessary, buy based on the features, the 
maybe room EQ that you want to use, things that you, channel count, sub outs, that kind of stuff that you're going to utilize in an ABR or pre. Don't buy based on like, oh, this one's got this stack. Dude, you're not going to be able to tell unless mm -hmm. it is terrible. And years ago, you probably could because I think there was a difference many, mm -hmm. many years ago. Early days of digital DAX. But now everything has gotten so good that there's definitely a measurable difference. Audio Science Review has shown that, but we can't hear it. We're well past that threshold. So yeah. there's no reason to go down that. And that's why I really say that at the for most situations, if you only need that number of channels, Den and Morantz every day of the week. Mm -hmm. No question. They've been solid, man. I'm, I mean, I've been rocking my 11. I had the 11, I'm sorry, 7705 and the 7706. Rock solid, man. All right. So. I keep starring these because they're great, great questions. <laughs> man, I'm they're not, was, they're not, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying. All right. Gabe says, any budget process, video processor, budget video processor. So I'm guessing $2,000 less. Just buy a Denon 3800H. Are, are there aren't any budget video processors for two? Oh, I mean, video no, processors. What budget I, is there? There are the IOTA. They're, they're these funky brands. Tone Winner has one. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. even know anything about it. I just IOTA. On a I'll budget? See. Yeah. The There's free version I, of Mad VR. Right, right. 1700 bucks. So uh, in processor world, that's super inexpensive. Let me close some of these tabs. Got way too many open. Close that one. Okay. Now Gabe, if you're at all handy at PCs and understand like how to get things operational yourself and kind of understand video, the free version so of Mad VR. Your 17 channel processor for 1700 bucks. Uh, that's not a wait a second. Are you talking video about video processors? Yeah, he's talking about video processors. Oh, did I read it wrong? I did the wrong at the very sorry. beginning. Okay. All right, my bad. All right, scratch what I said. Gabe asked a great question. Any budget video processors that you would recommend? My free bad, version man. of Mad VR. Okay. All right. And I, I think there's an entry level Lumigen. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, dude, we're going on two hours and 41 minutes. I know. No more that? stars. No more stars. I'm done. <laughs> right, and I'm going to do another one. Medi. Oh. Uh, ALR better for laser? So no. ambient light rejection? No. So you only need that if you have lots of ambient light in your room. There's a there's a couple of questions around this. If you want to bring up the other questions okay. about uh, screens and stuff, I think we can hit them all at the same sure. time. Medi, how often should you upgrade projector screen? I don't think you really need to. I mean, so mine, but every time I'm buy, on your screen, that's about you it. buy that's a projector it. screen. Go ahead, Jonathan. Before no, I go I'm just make a name joke. Go ahead. You're you got it. So you buy a projection screen based on what you need it to do and how you need it to perform in your room, right? So you buy, if you have a bunch of light or you have some light that you need to omit from your reflected back image, you would potentially buy an ambient light rejecting screen. That's what they're for. Yep. Part of the reason a lot of ALR screens are gray or black is because if you're in a ambiently lit room, you're potentially washing out your image. They are using those colors to bring back part of that contrast. Yeah. However, this brings in a compromise. And that compromise is when you have an underlying color like gray or black, your whites are now off color. So yeah, you're potentially correcting your, con your black level. Could be crushing it as well. So pushing past it and losing detail. But now you're also potentially offsetting your white point. So your white is not potentially real white. It's something else or like an off white. Mm -hmm. So the best screen in a perfectly black room is unity or gain of one white. That's it. Mm -hmm. Because if it's perfectly black and the projector is the capability of turning off light to that particular area, which none do right now that I'm aware of, um, it's going to be. Well, I guess the Christie Eclipse and however it's doing it is going to be black. Mm -hmm. So you just want to buy the screen based on the characteristics of whatever you need in your space. If you're trying to get rid of light, buy an ambient light rejecting screen. If you're using a short throw, buy a UST screen. 
If you need gain because your projector is overtly dim or your screen's huge or whatever you're trying to do, buy a positive gain screen. If your projector is way too bright for some reason, you could potentially tamper that down by having a negative gain screen or a below Unity. There's a bunch of different things that you can do, and this is why there's so many different versions of screens. Yeah, and even like on my my setup, you know, technically I probably should have a tighter weave screen, like the what is it, Center Stage UF, because you can fine. sit closer. But I don't notice it. I, I've never yeah. once noticed the weave at nine foot. So now, so can I, see I think it? maybe I think 350 is asking because he's got a a silver ticket screen mm -hmm. so i think i think silver tickets are fine i don't think there's anything wrong with them if they mm -hmm. tick all the boxes it's great a lot of people will just use a white wall or some type of like what a pvc or something or nylon or whatever Scott's they're doing paint, like scott newbie he actually painted his wall so it just depends on what you're trying to do the problem with a lot of screen manufacturers though is they lie about their gain and whatever the reflective rating of the particular screen is. So you have to be very careful about trusting those values. The only ones that I know of that are decently accurate, and some may dispute me in this, that are pretty consistent are Seymour and Stewart. So take that for what it is. Um, one of the other problems that I have with some of the other screens, the cheaper ones, is if you get them in a really base heavy room and i speak from experience you can actually rattle the frame and there's things in there that are not unmovable and this yeah. low frequency will rattle it around and you'll be able to hear it hmm. and we got good questions tonight dude lots to go three more promise unless ryan stars anymore. i'm not <laughs> starring in anything else ryan Michael <laughs> and jonathan i'm gonna throw this in there to jonathan too have you do you know anyone going from RS2 to Captivator 4000 ELF or Captivator 4000 back to RS2s? If so, what was their reasoning? Ryan is actually doing Definitely that. not me. <laughs> He's going from Captivator 4000 ELFs to RS2. And why would you potentially do that, Ryan? Lower frequencies. Okay. I can't get below 10 hertz in my room. Interesting. Measured. I, I want the lower frequency because I'm a low, masochist. You want the five hertz youth man? I want the foundation destroying frequencies to be present in my room in nice. all of their glory. That's really what it comes down to. The And they're smaller. The 4,000s, I, mean, I don't have room for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I do this in my room, I, I don't have space when I redesign the room. They're too big. They're phenomenal to me, subs. To me, going the opposite, somebody that went from a RS2 to a 4,000, they just want more output. Output. You so. cannot compete... There's very few things that'll compete with a 4,000 in output. It's now, with insane. that said, I don't need any more output than two RS2s. It's insane. I mean, it's Loser. a lot. Hey, I'm just saying. JP, Storm Audio Fusion 20 versus Marantz AV10. Mm. So, AVR versus separate, Storm versus Marantz. Would he even be able to tell a difference? So the AMP 10, from what I understand, does, does not necessarily deliver all rated power to all channels driven. Okay. It acts like an AVR, and it's going to tamper things down with the more channels that you drive. The Fusion is going to deliver full on all the time. It's like having a PA-16 inside your... AVR. The thing's a hoss. Nice. So there's a considerable price difference between those two. Um, the Marantz AV10 I think is fantastic. Jonathan has one. Um, I don't think the AMP10 is bad. I think it's a decent AMP. Uh, Gene at Audioholics likes it. <clears throat> at least he did when it first came out. Um, I personally think you have more control. It depends on how into the weeds you want to get with this. You have more control over the EQ in the storm. I think you have more granular control over everything than you do with the Marantz, even with the multi EQX and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's correct. It is the AV10 is a processor, Jed. 
I don't know, JP. I would reach out to me. Let's have a conversation. I pride myself on if you're going to purchase one or the other on choosing what is best for you and making suggestions based on what's best for you. So even if it's something that is neither of those and is considerably cheaper, I'll make that suggestion. Um, they're, you're looking at two really good offerings, though. I have a question yeah. for you on one topic of that mm -hmm. of that answer you gave. Mm -hmm. So the Marantz Amp 10, Gene says he tested it with seven channels listen, seven channels drift driven, mm -hmm. and it did 215 watts per channel with seven channels driven, and he didn't test further than that. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do yeah, I, I would how agree do I at that? some I would agree at some point it's probably not gonna deliver 215 watts yeah. per channel because it can't with the input wattage coming from a circuit. Probably. Let me look at what's the back of that thing got. Yeah, it's got one inlet. Does it? I can't zoom in on the picture, but I put. I, I would. I would agree. It's probably not going to produce that. But the other one, the storm is rated 150 watts. So even as the Marantz starts tailing down, do you know where that hits 150? I mean, I don't know. They're starting at a different place. Marantz starting higher, so I don't mm -hmm. know where that would be either. I don't know. But you wouldn't be able to hear that difference power wise. 150 to 200 watts is not very much difference in dB. No. It's like a dB at most. So one tick on your volume knob, which is not very much. Very negligible. So well, let's have a conversation we, about it. For the last question, um, just throw this out real quick. M Wave 2024 making plans June 21st through the 23rd. General tickets go on sale in what two days? November the 1st, and then we'll have VIP home theater experiences go on sale a month later on December the 1st. Those will be an add-on to your general admission ticket, and they'll be just a la carte. And so we've got some information on the website. You can get all that on the website, MidwestAVExperience.com. We'd love to have you join us. It's going to be amazing. And the final question of the night at 2 hours, 51 minutes, <laughs> Jonathan's dying over here. I am. <laughs> Go He's ahead. like, what did I get myself? I told you to <laughs> bail a long time ago, man. We're nuts. Ultimate one six two four says, "What do you guys think of the Arndall seventeen twenty three line speakers? Sound wise, full transparency. I literally unboxed the subwoofers. See, I've been saying subwoofers lately. You got subwoofer. Me Sounds <laughs> like you guys moved to Canada." From the Midwest cool. now, from the Midwest. So I haven't even had a chance to set them up in my room yet. I still have to unbox the um, surrounds, dial in, uh, you know, calibrate them, level match them, do all that fun stuff before I can even really give any. I haven't even. Li I've listened to a little bit of uh, what do we watch Survivor the other night, but that's, you know, I didn't even bother changing my EQ settings because we're not watching anything amazing. We're just watching a TV show. So, yes, yeah, so I don't have much comments as far as what they sound like because i haven't had i've had very limited jonathan you had the uh, 1723 monitors? thx yeah you had the monitors yeah and then ryan you had the monitors briefly mm -hmm. same speakers so, yeah what do you guys think of them you had the same speakers i did yep mm -hmm. the man they guy. they could have saved a, a set just let us share them i guess but well okay. i sent mine to michael oh okay they're the set he has so uh, in answer to your question, I think they sound fine. I don't, it goes back to that whole thing where everybody has preferences for what speaker they like. Mm -hmm. I know my preference is a little different than the Arendelle, but I can't necessarily say negative things about it. Like it did, it performed admirably. There was a little bit of a compression testing concern, which we've talked about before, which I don't think I saw that it could go to THX reference volume in my room at 12 foot, which is kind of what I would have expected or hoped for. Right. Um, but that's it's to be expected, sound, giving that, the character. You know, listen to them and see what you think. But isn't the not being able to hit reference volume? I mean, that's be that's to be expected with the characteristics of those speakers. With, because the, <laughs> good night, girls. With the with the driver combination that it has, yes, because yeah. it's a soft dome tweeter, a single, mm -hmm. and so it's not doing anything wrong. It's just what the the driver limitation is. And when I talked to Arendelle about it in brief, they said that basically in short term testing, like a single test, it'll perform better than long term testing. Yeah, I was kind of doing more of a long term test where you're just kind of letting it sweep for 20 sweep. or 30 seconds instead of yeah. a single sweep. Um, 
here's how I would describe it. Very neutral, very like transparent, very laid back, kind of like not in your face, just reserved. Like it's, 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 it's like a, I don't know, laid back speaker. Now my JBL pro audio speakers have a different sound. So we talked about earlier how I think subs sound the same within the means. I don't think speakers sound the same at all. And so mm -hmm. they don't, uh, to me, I never like, I never latched onto them personally speaking, but I don't have a problem with them. And I know the next guy over that listens to him might totally feel opposite of me. He might love that and not prefer you know, like more live sound. I prefer yeah. more live sound personally speaking. Well, they were pretty, they were decently liked at the speaker comparison. Mm -hmm. They were in the top three with SVS Martin, Martin Logan. So people liked them. I think they're good speakers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's Jonathan's compression testing doesn't necessarily it's not a bad thing that that speaker wasn't able to do sustained reference volume. It's a soft dome tweeter. It's not expected that it's going to do that. Mm -hmm. You need to, you need like a compression driver, um, a coaxial a line array like Jonathan's got some type of planar magnetic or a horn to be able to do that in a sustained way that's super sensitive. So don't think that that's us knocking the speaker because we're not. It's just right. it's a characteristic of that design choice, right? It's easier to work with. And we this was mentioned when we were talking to Arendelle during our stream was they did that because there were pros to doing that. So mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. Um, I think they're a very neutral speaker. There's nothing wrong with them, really. I mean, I don't they're not my favorite i know with very quickly if i'm gonna like a speaker or not and i didn't dislike it but it wasn't something that i'm like that's going in my room or something that i would want in my room yeah and but I think to somebody that, else it, they may be yeah See, yeah that's, that, I mean, that's the thing it's it's so subjective and so personal preference related it and is. i also think i also think from all these years of doing this that we built up these biases and there's an advantage home team that's hard to that's hard to dismiss sometimes because yes. hey i've listened to these speakers in here for 5 years at this point if i get right. a speaker in here that doesn't sound like what my home team is i'm like it's got a it's got a little hurdle to overcome from the very get go I, that's just the way humans are mm -hmm. so i think it's we build up a bot like you just said a bias of ourselves and like for me the reason that i chose the black swans over anything else was because the big reason was because how they image i mm -hmm. have up to that point i had yet to find a speaker that was sensitive enough to get and do the things that i wanted it to do with the new theater direction that i was going that image the way that I wanted because I was used to listening to Martin Logan's and my Martin Logan's really the thing that they're known for is imaging, right? They're when I listen to something, the center vocalist, if like, if I'm listening to Adele, hello, I just like to use that one. Cause most people have heard that song. She is size appropriate and she's right in the middle. Size like she's in the room. <laughs> well, she doesn't sound like she's like the whole wall or anything. Yeah, she yeah. sounds like she would be up there. So, it was very difficult for me to find a speaker that I liked because I've gotten used to that when listening to electrostatic speakers. We all develop habits and likes and dislikes both based on the experiences that we've had in our life. This is why people like different audio frequencies. They like different speakers. They like video to be shown a certain way. Some people like motion. Some people like don't. It's all based on our life experiences, and we are a culmination of that. Mm -hmm. So people are going to like one thing or not another based on that culmination. So just because Jonathan and I don't think they're our favorite doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad speakers. It just means right. that because of what we've liked and what we've gotten used to, which is very different than what the most industry has. I mean, look at what Jonathan has in his room and look yeah. what I have in my room. It's very oh, not typical. part of the norm and not typical to what most mm -hmm. people are going to have. And that creates an experience or a choice that may not fit with the norm of what most people will like. So I'm off my soapbox. I just want to make sure that people don't think that it's a bad speaker because of us saying we don't like it. Right. Or and it's I'm, not even that we don't like it. It's just that it's not our favorite. I'm going to pull back to this test. And I've mentioned this several times before, but it's so important that people recognize this kind of thing. I was at a blind test with two speakers, AB. One was JTR, one was Salk. 
That's an audiophile speaker with a soft do with a ribbon tweeter. The SOC was. It's the H2TL or something like that. And the JTR212. Uh, at the time, it was the HT, but it's the three way. So it would have been HTR equivalent today. At any rate, through that listening contest, we played like an hour, hour and a half for, full of music, and we were sitting in the same spot, and they were A, B, and quick switching. Mm -hmm. The JTR gave me chills multiple times, like unanimous across the entire bullet list, I preferred the JTR. The guy sitting immediately right to me was equivalent mm -hmm. experience, like long time in the hobby, lots of experience with speakers. At the end, I mean, this was pretty, this was maybe 2014, 2015, like that time frame. Before that point, I always thought if things were set up equivalent and you were in the same room at the same time, that there would be a universally preferred speaker. Like this speaker is better. The majority will clearly say the speaker is better. That was my expectation. I loved speaker A. Speaker B didn't ever give me a single chill. Like did nothing for me. At the reveal, I didn't even know which one was which. I had my suspicion, but I didn't know which was which because it truly was a blind test. The guy next to me said, I love speaker B. Speaker A didn't do anything for me. We're sitting mm -hmm. this far apart yeah. and we have completely different like emotional connections to a speaker. So you, mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta wrap anyone's recommendation or preference in that kind of outlook because we all hear differently. We all mm -hmm. expect different things from our biases as Ryan was just talking about. So yeah, it means nothing if Ryan or I is in our favorite speaker. It might be your favorite speaker and that's totally legit. You might think ours is not your favorite speaker. That's totally legit too. It's, well, it's to even it's speak preference. on that. Jonathan loves the JTR sound. Mm -hmm. I like their subs, but I don't, really care for the speakers because mm -hmm. i'm used to this right mm -hmm. and it's a very different experience it doesn't mean they're bad it's just i am a culmination of what i have gotten used to and my brain has decided and have developed a bias towards that it's just mm -hmm. and how it is it doesn't nature. surprise me at all that i love the the jtr sound mm -hmm. because i've always enjoyed clips they're yeah. both horn speakers horns have a kind of a unique sound mm -hmm. they're a little bit more forward, you know, than your typical, like you said, laid back soft dome tweeter. Um, I love the compression drivers in them. They get, you know, they can go as loud as you want, or they can go as quiet as you want. You've got good dynamic range, um, but that's not for everybody. hundred percent. So always, 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 we recommend come here as many systems as you can. And that's one reason why we, we try to get as many brands at M wave for you guys to be able to hear firsthand, so that you can make your own decisions. You may go into the SVS room and go, holy cow, this is everything I ever dreamed and wanted, and this is amazing. Or you may go into the RBH and go, man, this is my dream setup, you know? Come hear them, listen to them. Go experience some of these in-home theater experiences so that you can hear them in a, a regular home theater that's been room acoustically treated and been dialed in over years and years and years, you know? So, um, and the good thing is some of these companies, even like Arundel, they've got a 90 day return policy. So if, you know, I would, I wouldn't recommend ordering a whole surround sound system, but maybe order a pair of speakers, check them out. Mm -hmm. SVS, they've got a return policy. I think you do have to pay for shipping back on both of those companies. Um, but I would much rather get something and lose money sending them back than just ordering something blind because some content creator said, Hey, I like this or a guy on a forum or Facebook said, you know, you said, Hey, what speaker should I buy in this budget? And they say, you need to buy this and you buy them. And you're like, this sounds like trash. And now you're stuck with them. Mm -hmm. So yep. I would much rather, you know, gotta go listen. Yeah. So we'd love to have you for M wave, man. Even if you're There's out one more question and I just checked it because it was fast. Uh, oh, I see, I see. <laughs> you suck. PK, right. I was really trying to get us under three hours, but it ain't happening. PK, I wanted to go over it. Appreciate the last question of the night. <laughs> Ryan, Sony 5000 laser projector or Epson laser projector. Uh -huh. Sony has one of has a lot of fan noise. What is your take on Sony's banding issues and night mm. scenes? I don't know if it means night or right scenes, which some YouTubers like Shane Lee keep mentioning. In that price range, I'm going to choose the Epson every single time. Okay. I just think it's a more well-rounded projector uh, than the 5,000 and the 5,000 can get quite loud. Mm -hmm. So I think the Epson is the LS 12,000 for what it has. And it comes with a mount. It's very, very hard to beat um, in that price point. They're the king and Epson mm -hmm. knows it. So 
a lot of us were hoping that they'd release something that, that was a higher like price point. They haven't done that yet. Um, but I think if you're looking at those two projectors, the only two really, I think in that price point that you may, well, I, if I were in that position, I would do the Epson. NP5 is what you're going to say too, right? That's I wasn't going to say anything. But it's not, but it's not laser, but it is a consideration. It is, but it's not a laser. If you're interested in that Epson, shoot me an email. I've got one that needs a home. Needs a home. Needs a home. Needs a home. All home theater equipment just wants to feel loved. <laughs> hey, we all want to feel loved. Oh, man. Where was it at real quick? Oh, yeah. So appreciate more. the no, no. Appreciate the quick, uh, the correction. 60 day trial, not 90. I said 90 earlier. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Very cool, man. This has been a long night. Fellas, you are amazing. You guys asked some killer questions. I hope, really, I really hope that the podcast provides just some level of resource to you that are building a home theater. Maybe you're trying to tweak your setup. Uh, appreciate it. Siphonics audio. Yeah. Three hours. It's been definitely a long night, but we really want to give back to the community as much as we can. Want to be a resource to you guys. Um, and again, if you're uh, wanting to hear some of this stuff firsthand, experience some things firsthand. And, you know, I know it's a shameless plug, but I'm going to throw it out there, man. Come to M wave. We'd love to have you. It. all the details. We've got people as far as the UK that have booked tickets already, not tickets, but booked their, hotels and their airbnbs and we've got um folks from canada and hawaii so we're really excited i've got local guy not local but guys in the u.s that have booked their stays already so come see us man we're gonna have fun jonathan it's always a pleasure you guys both of you are wealth of knowledge i appreciate what you bring to the home theater community your attitude as well as your knowledge and experience will there be levels of vip tickets for 2024 um and jonathan you're free and if you want to jump yeah i think i might jump off here good, all right later good talking to you guys thanks guess we got some in wave questions later man uh randy will there be levels of vip tickets so the short version of that right now and i'll just put this up here and it'll make sense number one check out my video um i forget what i titled it but it's basically like an in wave update so i've got that on there but in that video I shared kind of what our plan is for M wave 2024 general tickets, $75 will go on sale in two days, November 1st, a month later, December the 1st, we'll have VIP home theater experiences. They'll go on sale. So those are two separate things. You'll need both, not need both. VIP, I'm sorry. The general admission gets you into the event three days at the convention center. The VIP experiences are outside that convention center. So they're just a la carte. If you wanted to do one like Jonathan's home theater, that's $200. If you wanted to do Jonathan's and Stephen Dews, that would be $400 because it's $200 a piece. Um, if you want to do three of them, we're going to offer three different time slots. One, say the nine, I'm a, I don't know the exact time I have to go on the website, but it's basically like nine and then say about one o'clock and then like four o'clock. So basically a morning, mid afternoon and evening, and there's only going to be enough. There's only going to be tickets for the amount of theater seats in that home. So if Jonathan has six theater seats, we're going to sell six theaters or six tickets to his home theater experience in the AM, six more in the mid afternoon and six in the evening. And the same thing with all of them. You can see all those on the website. If you go up to the um, attend and then the second option down is home theater experiences. You can see all those there. Ryan and I have talked about, you know, basically there's two thoughts that may just replace the VIP. So that might just be VIP. So if you're a general mission and you do a VIP experience, you're a VIP. We're going to do a dinner uh, probably Saturday night. Like we did last year, you'll be invited to that. Plus you get, access to one, two, or three, however many home theater experiences you purchase. What we don't know is will we offer like a VIP gold or VIP platinum? The hard part is just figuring out like, I mean, I, I don't know what, what you would want out of that, if that makes sense. You know, is there a need for that? Um, 
we just know we can't open up like these home theater experiences to a thousand people. We physically can't do it. So you have to be able to separate that. Um, let's see. No, there won't be one for Scott Newby's place. He just, he's going to actually be at the event, but he's too far. Um, you probably have to, I don't even know how, I think he's like eight hour drive. Be way too far. Mm -hmm. He's in outside Chicago. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Last year there was regular VIP for Friday night stuff. I think you answered this one. Yeah. So that, that's what I mean. So, yeah. So we'll still, we still plan on doing one of the night. I think it was Saturday night. We had the VIP dinner. Um, cause Friday night's more like an intro hanging out. Um, see if there was anything else on M wave. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's definitely too far though to do that. But yeah, man, we'd love to have you guys out there. So um, if you got any questions, hit me up. You can reach out via email or even on the uh, M-Wave website, MidwestAVExperience.com. We'll be glad to get back with you, but we're excited, man. Christopher, interest in you. shoot me an email. Dude, you can pop these up too under banner. There I you did. Go. No, you didn't put the banner up. You know, oh. if you say shoot me an email, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but I depend on you. <laughs> I see. I'm like, I'm like how my wife is to me, you know, she does yeah. things and then subconsciously yeah. thinks that I'll know to do things. So yeah, I, this is, this is a question we've gotten a couple of times. So we're still working on the final schedule for the event. Uh, last year we did five to 9 PM on Friday. And then it was like nine to five roughly on Saturday and Sunday. We may end let's say an hour early on Sunday, like at 4 PM. Cause it did get pretty dead near the very end of Sunday mm -hmm. this past year in 2023. And that would give our brands extra opportunity as well as us to tear down and get back home. We may extend Saturday and then shorten Sunday. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's in general Friday night, all day, Saturday, all day, Sunday, but the actual hours may vary a little bit from last year. What's your email, Ryan? Ryan at Ascend AV, or you can shoot us an email on the website. He gets, it goes to him as well. Hey guys, Maybe that, that is just a form that you fill out and then it goes to Michael and I, Yeah, that's all that is. So it's yep. just allows us to categorize things and it makes it easier for you guys. Cause you don't have to remember an email, but you can do either. It doesn't yep. matter. Thought you guys were done. I love my room. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens. Jonathan Bale. We started talking M Wave, and so there was some questions that came up. So we figured we'd address those. Uh, um, hope to go for 2025. Yeah, Tito. We'd love to have you, man. Tito, where are you at? Where are you located? You out of state, out of country? Yeah, man. We'd love to have you. It's been cool, man. The the love and support that we've gotten from the community about M Wave, those that have come. I'll be sharing some testimonial videos as well in the coming days. Um, so when is it, dude, I ain't doing no 24 hours live stream, but that does remind me, I think I'm going to be a guest on. Yeah. I'm going to be a guest on, I think it's next in November on a 24 hour live stream. No yep. bright side podcast on November the 4th is a 24 hour podcast. He's not what? No, maybe it's not 24 hour. Maybe he's doing 12 hour podcast. I've done some 12 hour streams. No, I just like with flight sim stuff. Yeah, no it's thank exhausting. You. Yeah. He asked if I'd be if I'd come on for an hour. So I'll be a guest, but I'm not doing one. Have no oh he's in Puerto Rico. Very cool man. Yeah come see us buddy. Yeah. I just had sure. a guy come in last week to do some yeah. demos from there. Sure. My email address is pretty easy. Michael at youthmanreviews.com. Right here. I'll put that up. I think the movie night idea, I don't think we could all do it on the same night, but doing it like a book club where we could just name oh, a movie and yeah, he's nuts. I'll go watch it. I think that'd be super cool to have a mm -hmm. conversation point and have yeah. the chat watch it with us. I mean, that'd be I cool. Just don't think, I just don't think you can do like live. No, 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 no. I'm saying like we would name a movie at the end of the podcast or at the beginning or something. And then everybody would watch it at some point during that week. And then we yeah. could talk about it briefly at some point during the next week's stream. I mean, I think that'd be cool because it's. So, hey, Michael, since Ryan thinks this is so cool, I would shoot him an email address. 
I'm just going to tell you to do stuff. I'm not going to. I have enough on my plate. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, send me an email. Yeah. I mean, now that I see it, it was like, oh, I want to work on this movie night. I think it's no. awesome. Just send me, send me an email. I got to get caught up on these reviews. You guys are asking about that. Um, yeah, the movie night would be awesome. 14 hours of a charity stream. That is long for sure. No, that's no way. Yeah. Well, cool, guys. On the way out, hit the like button if you don't mind, if you enjoyed the stream. If you didn't, don't come back next week. I'm just kidding. No, but seriously. Huh? What? <laughs> I just, I feel sleep deprived now, but I'm still in a great mood, dude. And Ryan was in a good mood tonight, man. I'm he still in a good mood. I'm just getting tired. Yeah. Well, it's been long. So cool, man. Well, I know the, oh, no. Never mind. I was looking at something else. All right, guys. Y'all have a great week. I'm going to end the stream. Take care. Love y'all. See you guys later.